like to call to order the regular meeting of the Bone Marine Board of Commissioners for May 21st, 2019. I invite you to stand if you choose while I offer the invocation and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Father, we thank you for another wonderful day in our community and we thank you for the people that are here to help uh, manage the city government in a way that you would be pleased with. Please give us guidance and wisdom as we consider these items tonight and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll roll. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Perrigan. Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. Uh, it's time for awards and recognitions. Mr. Meisel, I think you have one for us. I do have one, Mayor. Uh, we, the Finance Department recently received the, uh, the GFOA Certificate of Achievement and Excellence for Financial Reporting again. Again? Uh, again. This is for the FY18 CAFR. Uh, this is the 13th consecutive year in a row uh, for this award. I'd like to thank Katie and Aaron and, and Sean. Aaron does a lot of the the, the grunt work on the CAF for putting it all together. So my special thanks to her for all of her, her, her hard work on the, the document itself. It's about 150 pages or so, as you recall, and a lot of numbers and uh, a lot to put together. So I'd like to thank uh, the finance team for this award and uh, for getting this award for us. And uh, for that's 13, 13 straight years. So congratulations. To you. And then we have uh, Leda Becker here tonight. She has uh, has something to present or something to, I, th I guess, receive. Sorry, ask her to come up. Mayor, Board of Commissioners, thank you for having me tonight. I had the opportunity to be invited to speak at the Warren County Women's Democratic Club recently about my role as International Communities Liaison for the City of Bowling Green. And I talked to them a, a little bit about a new program, the Naturalized BG program, which uh, provides uh, a stipend or scholarship for individuals in our city who are pursuing their citizenship or naturalization. And uh, so the club um, got together, and we have here the representative, Margaret Groves, and they wanted to give a, a donation um, of $500 towards that scholarship fund. So this is Margaret Groves. Um, on behalf of the women of the Warren County Democratic Party, we'd like to present a $500 check to Ms. Becker in uh, helping her with her efforts for the scholarship for naturalization application so that we can have more um, American citizens. These people are here ready to become a part of our country. They're a part of our community and we would like to welcome them and let them know that they have a place in Bowling Green in Warren County. Thank you, ma'am, for your so, donation. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Meisel? That mayor. Anyone else from the commission? I do have one, one quick item. I don't see Lieutenant Colonel Delaney here, who is uh, one of the features in uh, Kentucky Law Enforcement Magazine on building your team and leadership. And some other guy over there, I forget his, his face, down there in the back row. So he's there with us, too. Congratulations to the police department on, on their uh, efforts there, too. <laughs> All right, anything else? Do you have any comments tonight, Mr. Meisel? I do not. First item is approval of our minutes for the regular meeting on May 7th, 2019. So moved. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Nash. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-67. Municipal order approving the probationary appointment of Magalie Martin to the position of administrative assistant in the Neighborhood and Community Services Department. Moved. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Denning. Mr. Meisel. 
to a retirement in NCS. Uh, we have we had a vacancy, and I'd like to ask Erin Holsey, our HR director, to present her recommendation to fill this position. Thank you, commissioners. Um, when we had the vacancy back in March, our um, NCS director reviewed the responsibilities of this position, and um, this person will be continuing to do those administrative areas, but will also focus on assisting with the International Communities Coordinator, Leda Becca, Becker, as she currently does not have any official support. So um, a, a, the same role, but um, just a slightly different um, focus for her support. Um, in addition to those regular functions, um, we were looking preferably for someone who had an associate's degree in business administration or a related program and bilingual in English and another language. The employment opportunity was posted and advertised um, in both internal and external um, avenues. We received 115 applications. Human Resources reviewed the applications and sent the department 57 applicants. The department selected 10 individuals to put through a computer skills test and interview. Three candidates withdrew from the process and one did not show up to the interview. The six remaining candidates were interviewed by Brent Childers, Leda Becca, Becker, Courtney Howell, and Tiger Tooley from the HR department. Megali Martin was selected. Megali, are you here to stand? Go ahead and rise. Um, and we are recommending her for appointment for the position. She has an associate degree in business administration from the Universidad Panamerica, as well as a bilingual American business secretarial degree from the American Business Academy. In 2017, Magali successfully completed the City of Bowling Green's Academy for New Americans Leadership Training Program. For the last 10 years, she has been employed by Warren County Public Schools at Drakes Creek Middle School as an ESL instructional assistant. In that position, she received the Golden Apple Award in recognition of her service to the international students. She has also served as the president of the South Warren High School varsity tennis team since 2015. Prior to her position with Warren County Schools, she was an executive assistant for the country manager of international shipping operations at Marisk Sealand in Costa Rica. Megali is bilingual in English and Spanish. Of all the candidates that applied, she has the best combination of skills, experience, and connection to the international community. Comments or questions from commission? Please call the roll. An ink? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Municipal Order 2019-68. Municipal Order approving the career path advancement of David Delp, Joshua Mitten, and Matthew White to the position of Operations Technician 1 in the Public Works Department. So moved. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Meisel. As you all know, we do have a career path advancement in our Public Works Department. These three gentlemen have met all their qualifications. And I'll let uh, Aaron give a, a brief overview of, uh, of the process and, and the recommendations tonight for these uh, reclassifications. We have three requirements in order to promote um, to the OMT1 position. Um, that is to complete at least six months of employment, to possess a Class A commercial driver's license, and to have no pending disciplinary actions. Um, the three promotions are being recommended to David Delp, and um, Josh Mitten, who are not able to be here tonight, but Matthew White um, is here. You want to rise to be recognized? Um, all three have met the criteria for the program, and I'm recommending them for promotion. Thank you, Aaron. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Binning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Congratulations. Thank you. Municipal Order 2019-69. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Gray Cottle to the, to the Bowling Green Historic Preservation Board. So moved. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Nash. Uh, this replaces the unexpired term of Troy Brooks. Uh, Mr. Cottle owns several properties in the historic district and uh, his wife is on the um, Heritage Foundation. What's that, what's that called? I forget. Landmark Association. Landmark. Yes, okay. couldn't think Sorry. of it. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Inning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019 70. 
Municipal order authorizing renewal of bid number 2017-55 for fire uniforms from Galls LLC of Lexington, Kentucky and Nats Outdoor Sports of Bowling Green, Kentucky based on unit prices. Moved. Second. And second by Denning, Mr. Mosley. We bid this out uh, in FY18 for the fire department for their uniforms and their exercise wear and shoes. And we got uh, some winners were Gulls and Nats, and we had options to renew these deals for two additional years. We are recommending that we exercise that third year option for FY20. Uh, both companies have locked in their prices for the upcoming FY20 fiscal year and recommend your approval to extend this for the last year. Comments or questions? Overall? Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-71? Municipal order authorizing the continuation of an agreement with Care Here PLLC for administering employee on site medical clinic services for fiscal year 2020. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Meisel. Uh, 2019 is our fourth year beginning with our health. It's hard to believe it's been, we're in our fourth year, but this is beginning our fourth year with our employee health clinic. Uh, we have Care Here as our provider contract agent and we are recommending that we continue that relationship and I'll pass it on to, over to Aaron for further details on uh, this renewal of the agreement. Um, just a couple of um, uh, thoughts that I wanna share with you as we've had three full years with the clinic. Um, it does take a little bit of time to start realizing and recognizing some of the financial benefits um, of the uh, of having the clinic and and one of those is that um, the people on the health care plan have a, um, a, a a place to go to that is going to be high quality of care um, they're not going to have to pay for it the the city takes on those expenses and um, and and therefore it replaces some of the um, more expensive provider visits um, medications that they might have to deal with otherwise um, and based on our calendar year of 2018, it's estimated that we saved over $400,000 in our medical claims by having the clinic. Um, based on the last 13 months, um, ever since um, September of 2018, we've been over capacity at the clinic, so um, we definitely have high utilization. It, it took a little bit of time for our employees to realize that um, this could be a primary care physician for them and their families, um, and we're definitely seeing that. And in addition to that, um, looking at our survey scores from our employees, um, our net promoter score is 96. 98.5% of the people surveyed would recommend the clinic. Um, and in terms of rating the um, Care Here's healthcare center and team, um, we had 100% of surveyors um, rate the service there as good or excellent um, in, in terms of quality of care. So um, it's a very good partnership with Care Here, and we certainly would like to continue. Thank you. Any comments, questions? I'm going to make a comment. That is my primary care, my family's primary care, and it's, it's a wonderful place. Our, I just rec I highly recommend using that. It's really a great welcoming place. Anybody else? Please call the roll. Denning? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-72. Municipal order authorizing the continuation of a contract with JNF Janitorial Services Incorporated of Somerset, Kentucky for janitorial services in the amount of $211,060. I moved. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Meisel. This is another contract we have where we have uh, a multiple year options here, and this is, our, of course, our janitor services. We bid this out uh, four years ago, and we got uh, four years of options on this one. FY20 would be the final year of this contract. We are tweaking the contract just slightly. We are backing off the services to the fire department administrative building for 13,520, bringing down this total cost of, on this contract to back down to 11,060, which is kind of where we were two years ago. So we are recommending to continue services from our JNF janitorial services 
and for the total of 211060 for the fifth and final year, recommend your approval. Comments or questions? Call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-73. Municipal order authorizing public safety software subscription services from N4 Public Sector Incorporated in the amount of $72,473.98. Second. By Nash, second by Beasley Brown. Mr. Meisel. Our 911 uh, software system is more or less the backbone of our public safety. Uh, without it, we are we're dead in the water, uh, so to speak. So this is a maintenance agreement that we do each year with uh, Public Sector Incorporate, N4 Public Sector Inc. And it is for annual maintenance of that software. We are in, in the process of finding another uh, system for that dispatch uh, center, 911 CAD system. And, but until then, we need to have uh, maintenance services uh, to keep that software up and running and to make any uh, upgrades to it that are necessary to make it functional. So uh, Lynn is here tonight to answer any questions. Lynn Hartley, if you have any questions on this uh, sole source contract or maintenance agreement with N4 Public Safety. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? <clears throat> yes. Municipal Order 2019-74. Municipal order authorizing and accepting the purchase of pulsar chlorine briquettes and infinity tablets from Spear Corporation of Rochdale, Indiana for fiscal year 2020 in an amount not to exceed $72,955.20 for the Parks and Recreation Department. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Denning. Mr. Meisel. We are in need of uh, chlorine for our, per for our pool, our aquatic center out at Russell Sims, as well as the Fountain downtown at Circus Square, the spray ground. And the system we have is a, a pulse, what they call a pulsar chemical feed system. And with that, there is only one sole source provider, and that's Spear Corporation. They are kind of the designated uh, dealer for Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, and Ohio. So uh, this is brought to you as a sole source uh, in the amount of 72 not to exceed 72955 over the coming months. We'll buy little bits at a time. Uh, as you'll see, there's an invoice in here for 12159 for the first delivery. So recommend your approval of this. It's a sole source. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-75. Municipal order authorizing the submission of a grant application to the U.S. Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, for the purchase of bulletproof vests for the police department in the amount of $14,438. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perridge and Mr. Meisel. We've been uh, getting these bulletproof vests grants for years. Uh, this is the next one that's coming up. We would like to submit for it in, in the amount of $14,438. These vests only last five years. Uh, that's kind of an expiration on those. So we try to replace them on a, a five-year cycle. We don't do all of them at once, but we do a few at a time each year. This grant would cover about two years' worth of replacements, uh, 35 vests, uh, total cost of 28875 and we would split that 50-50 if we get this, uh, this grant. We think we will. So recommend your approval of, of this uh, application for, to the Bulletproof Vest Program. This is from the U.S. Department of Justice. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2019-22. Ordinance providing for issuance of water and sewer revenue bonds. Ordinance of the City of Bowling Green, Kentucky, authorizing and providing for the issuance of City of Bowling Green, Kentucky, water and sewer revenue bonds, Series 2019, for the purpose of financing the acquisition and construction of additions, expansions, and improvements to its water treatment plant and the construction and installation of a sewer force main from the southern end of the sewer system to the Preston Avenue water, wastewater treatment plant. So moved. Second. Urgent second by Nash. 
Mr. Mosel? As you all know, we, uh, you, you all, the Board of Commissioners, uh, are responsible for anything relating to rates, uh, debt issuance, and uh, board appointments at BGMU. Tonight, BGMU comes to you all with a request for financing of their expansion down at the Water Treatment Center. And I'd like to ask uh, Mike Gardner, the uh, Division Manager of Water and Wastewater, to come up and present uh, his request. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Bowling Green and Warren County are growing. Uh, no news to you all. Uh, along with that, uh, we have uh, been using up capacity at the water treatment plant, and it's time to expand it so that we can uh, serve that anticipated growth. Uh, we took bids on a plan expansion here uh, uh, in late 19 or 2018, uh, awarded that project to Judy Construction, and we're going to be adding uh, 15 million gallons per day of capacity to the plant. That's a pretty big expansion, about 50% over what we've got right now. Uh, we looked at two different bids on that, and there was an economy of scale to go to, to 15 million gallons per day. So uh, we, got, we got good bids on that. So uh, essentially, that project is actually already under construction down on 31W right near uh, River Road at the old Louisville Road Bridge. And uh, we have uh, uh, started that process, but we need to get those bids out to support that construction activity. The second project is for a, a growth that's happening in the, the south and east part of the county. Our wastewater interceptors across town have been loaded up pretty well, and we need to, to get new interceptor capacity. Unfortunately, the wastewater plant is on the exact opposite side of town of where the, a lot of the growth is. So we need a new conveyance to get it, get it around there. That project anticipates a force main that will be built along Veterans Force Main, excuse me, Veterans Boulevard uh, from the south part of the, can of the, the city to uh, the wastewater treatment plant. So those are the, just a nutshell of the project. There's no obligation to the city. This is all uh, under BGMU. Uh, it was anticipated in the rates. BGMU rates are not going up because uh, they're already baked into those, those rates. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding the project itself. Chip Sutherland uh, is here uh, to talk about the actual bond issuance and whatnot. Chip is with Hilliard Lions, and uh, so I'll answer any questions or turn it over to, to Chip. Uh, I got a question. How, how many years of growth do you think this, this new facility is going to I mean, at, at the rate that we're growing basically yeah. uh, that's a good that's a good question we anticipate this is probably uh, depending on weather patterns because it's all driven by summer summer high demand usually during drought years when lots of lawn watering and whatnot is going on we haven't had one of those really deep droughts since about 2009 uh, we hit 27 million gallons that summer we haven't been up over about 24 in the last couple of years but to answer your question, we anticipate this is probably on the order of about 25 to 30 years of capacity that uh, we're building right now. And it's already been paid for in the last rate increase. The monies are there to... It, it is being paid for through the rate increase. We're not, we're not doing a rate increase on, on BGMU rates. Uh, I say that just to be clear to the folks yeah. watching. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Only Commissioner Denning will be here when you need to expand again. <laughs> <laughs> Another 30 years, Joe. And uh, I'm going to ask the question of then that I'm going to ask now. Uh, when is the bond maturity date? Bond was structured. Uh, it was a very interesting bond rate that uh, for Warren County Water District, who is sharing in this, it's been a collaborative effort with the Water District because a lot of that growth is occurring in their area. So the bonds will be issued through BGMU. The BGMU portion will be paid for, that's about 32% of the total bond, will be paid on a 20-year uh, bond schedule. Warren County Water District's portion, we have it structured that will be paid on a 30-year uh, schedule. I have a couple of questions related to water. Oh, did you have another follow-up? No, go no, ahead. Go ahead. I'm through. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, it, some of the conversations I've had around the water treatment plant, or maybe it's not the water treatment, 
I get confused, there's so many different treatment plants, but around Pearl Street and around the Delafield neighborhood. Right. Wastewater plant. Wastewater plant, okay, got it. Um, around um, the smell at certain times of the year and uh, inv investigating that for that neighborhood, I learned that we have, I forget the technical term, but a place where with all the growth from the county, it flows to one spot and then from there, it goes to the water treatment plant and there's certain places in town where it holds it. So is this what you're upgrading? And can you remind me what those things are called? <laughs> sure. Uh, the water treatment plant is pulling water out of the river and sending water out in the community. We're cleaning up and, and sending it out for, for public use. The wastewater plant then, uh, the conveyance takes it down to the Pearl Street facility. Uh, we clean it up and put it back in the river, incidentally cleaner than what we took it out. Uh, there, it, it is a biological process and there are some odors uh, associated with that. Of course, directly across the street from us, we have the solid waste transfer station that also is a, a pretty stinky process. Uh, so in the summertime, there, there are odors that, that uh, emanate there. We did have some complaints of odors when we were using a dryer for our biosolids. Uh, that, that facility has been shut down. It wasn't working properly for us. so. Uh, the odor situations have been improved, but uh, we have some other current uh, odor issues that we're working on to, to reduce our odors further at that facility. Um, so the, t tell me again the two systems you were changing. You said conveyance, you're working on upgrading those, and then there was another technical term you said you were upgrading. Sorry, I missed the first Another, part. so what were the two things you're upgrading again? We're upgrading the water treatment plant uh -huh. for capacity there, and we're putting in a new wastewater interceptor that will convey wastewater yes. from the south part of Bowling Green and Warren County. So where is that new interceptor it going will, to be? It is designed, uh, it is being designed right now, and we anticipate it will be along Veterans Memorial Boulevard from Russell Road near Industrial Drive up to, uh, near Hobson Grove and then cut across from, from veterans over to the treatment plant on Pearl Street. Do we currently have interceptors elsewhere in our city? We have multiple interceptors, yes. Okay. Most of those are gravity type interceptors. We have probably four major interceptors that come through town. Those are all loaded up. So that's why we're going around the perimeter. Uh, it, it's much easier to get that in there. And that will allow us to connect other growth areas along veterans that haven't developed yet. I'll turn it over to, to Chip at this point. He'll give a little summary on the bond. Good afternoon. Um, first, I just want to say congratulations to the city real quick on that. Well, I'm, I'm from the finance side, Chip Southern, the Hilliard Lines with my colleague, Mike Jefferson. So we come from a finance perspective. And so we hear about CAFR awards. We get kind of excited. So I just wanted to pass along congratulations. Um, just to keep it really simple and short, we have a, a bond sale that we have uh, scheduled for to sell on the 18th of June, and I think we close around the 27th of June. We expect really good interest rates because, not surprising to you all, BGMU has a really strong credit rating. Uh, we anticipate in the AA rating level where they currently are, and the city itself is, is highly rated. Um, so we're going to sell, like I said, on on uh, on. June the, the 18th. The interest rate we, we expect, as Mike said, it's a, in aggregate, it's a 30-year bond issue. And with that size, with the credit rating that we anticipate on it, and frankly, um, in Kentucky, with our general challenges with credit, you know, outside of Bowling Green, there's some credit challenges in Kentucky. And um, when you come to market with a revenue credit that's different than something that has state funding in it or a city credit that's strong like the city of Bowling Green, uh, with the general obligation, obligation credit, investors get really excited. And when it has the size that this one does, it brings in investors that you typically don't attract. The bond market in general has a, is uh, experiencing a, a dearth of supply. So um, we're just really excited to, to see what the interest rate results are. I'm happy to answer any more questions with you. Uh, Charlie Musson, who's bond counsel for BGMU with Ruben Hayes, he's here as well to answer any legal questions you all may have. But I, that's my short and sweet. Questions for? Uh, so I have just, a couple questions. Sorry, go just, ahead, Jeff. Just to confirm, though, Chip. So BGM is responsible for 32% of the debt service, which leaves 68% of the debt service res responsibility Correct. with the Warren County Water District. Correct. 
Is that, is yes, that sir. correct? Okay. And, you know, just to reaffirm, this is BGM, BGM, BGMU's credit is pledged towards it, not the city's, it's not the city's responsibility. Yes, yeah, ma'am. I wanted to check because you mentioned our credit rating too. So is this uh -huh. going to show up in terms of our debt that we have and will this impact our credit rating at all? Ma'am, great question. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a great question. And no, ma'am, it does not impact the rating of uh, BGMU. What you care about, or uh, Bowling Green, what you care about as a city is how well it's run. Uh, BGMU is, is, is a supremely run organization, and that's a reflection on your general credit. Um, but it, there's because of the way it's run and its, its stability, it has zero impact on, on you all. Does that help? Sure. Okay. So is there any situation in which we would be responsible for this debt or if um, you know, it was the project was overspent or, um, you know, something happened that was negative. Is there any way this has a negative impact on what is the relationship, I guess, between what, what responsibility do we have for yeah. these bonds? So this is why I'm glad Charlie Mustin came with, uh, with the heads that can give you some legal explanations on it. Um, and Charlie, I, I'm happy for you to pipe in here, but from a practical standpoint, you don't have, this is responsibility of the ratepayers of Bowling Green who happen to be taxpayers in the city of Bowling Green, but there's a distinction um, on what we're pledging is, or what BGMU is pledging is security for the bonds. The bonds are secured by the rate payers' ability to pay rates. So, Charlie, I, I'll, there you go. Um, you want to give a legal? <laughs> yes, I'd be, gl be glad to. Uh, it's a good question. And uh, we're going to use two terms here. One is called revenue debt, and the other one is called general obligation debt. When we talk about general obligation debt, we're talking about a city pledging its tax dollars to pay off debt. In terms of revenue debt, you find a revenue stream, and in this case, it's the water and sewer revenues of the system that are, in essence, come from ratepayers uh, to that goes to pay that debt. The two do not mix. Okay, you do not take tax dollars to pay your water and sewer debt. You don't take your water and sewer revenues to pay your tax debt. Uh, the issuance of these bonds, these revenue bonds, will have no effect on the city's ability to issue its own debt, its own tax revenue, its tax generated debt. Uh, it does not affect how much debt the city has. It is based totally on the water and sewer system. How much I appreciate that. <clears throat> you may have already answered it, but I'm going to ask if that is the case that BDMU is so strong uh, financial wise why does the city of Bowling Green have to be the seller of the bonds that's an excellent question uh, actually the water and sewer system is in essence owned by the city it's the city's water and sewer system the city contracts with or has sent the operation of the system over to BGMU BGMU is a, is a very interesting organization because not only does it do water and sewer operations, it has an electric system, and it's got a general division, which we'll call fiber optics, okay? Each division is, is kind of separate. BGMU has the legal authority under state law to issue debt for its electric system, for example, and for its fiber optic general division uh, section. The water and sewer system, because it is owned technically by the city and is been sent to BGMU to, to operate and to, to cover. That's why the city issues the debt. That's why the city decides on rate uh, changes in, uh, for the for the for the ratepayers of the water and sewer system. It is purely a state law situation. Uh, but we, as a city, have to list those bonds and maturity dates as a possible obligation do we not it's a obligation but only payable from the revenues of the water and sewer system if the water and sewer system were to go away the bondholders are out of luck it's as simple as that they cannot come back to the city and say please pay off the water and sewer debt okay any other comments or questions <laughs> thank you very much we appreciate it that's why there's an attorney sign on sign up for that. <laughs> Please call the roll. Binning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Harrigan? Yes. 
Beasley Brown. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. You are free to slip out if you want to. We'll get the air conditioner back on. So. <laughs> Municipal Order 2019-76. Municipal order approving fiscal year 2020 parks and recreation fees. Moved. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Miswell. I'd like to ask Brent Belcher, Parks and Rec Director, to come up and present uh, the changes he's proposing in parks <coughs> and recreation fees. <clears throat> Appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, Brent Belcher, Bonnery Parks and Rec. Thanks, uh, City Manager uh, Mr. Miswell and the Mayor Commissioners. Uh, Annually, we come in front of the uh, board commissioners and uh, want to kind of show our new fees, our uh, changed fees, and we'd like to give you this nice little pamphlet of our entire fee structure. Uh, we will not go through all those fees. I will try to uh, be as quick as possible unless you have questions, and obviously that's why I'm here. But uh, the first uh, chart, if you will, in my memo is new fees. Uh, we have a couple of new athletic programs. Uh, but also a couple new facilities, a new shelter at Lover's Lane that is adjacent to the, uh, the loops, the trail at Lover's Lane that we will begin renting out uh, as soon as uh, uh, this next fiscal year. And then uh, we do have a con under construction a, uh, a turf. Uh, it's renovating an asphalt court into a turf, we'll call it a field, uh, at Lampkin Park, so that will be available for rental uh, for reservations. And then, of course, the last part is the... Uh, renovations of Riverview, the golf course at Riverview, that would be the, uh, the nine-hole course and the, uh, in this particular instance, the range itself. And you can see the structure we're talking about there. Uh, for those listening at home, that would be $4 for 35 balls and $7 for 75 balls is what we're thinking. Uh, with that said, to adjusted fees, uh, we have some adjusted fees in cemeteries. It's been over a decade since we've adjusted fees in cemetery. That's a 10% increase in our fee structure. Uh, for grave sales and then uh, fitness is another area there are no uh, increases in fitness it's really consolidation uh, that would mean twenty dollars for a month use and racquetball aerobics and general fitness use all included whereas in the past it would be uh, I think it's thirty dollars for aerobics and, fit and general fitness use so uh, in essence you're not just consolidation, it's really a fee reduction when you kind of think of it like that. Uh, so uh, we feel like, number one, that was a recommendation from our auditor, uh, Deborah Jenkins, and number two, uh, it does streamline, streamline our operations from a, uh, an operational side. Uh, we won't have to worry about who's using aerobics and whether they've paid or not, and really everybody's welcome as long as they have a card. Uh, so uh, we feel like that'll make us not only more competitive in the fitness market, but uh, uh, more efficient as well. Uh, Crosswinds has some uh, membership rate increases, not daily increases. Uh, we are looking to make the, all of our nine hole rates when uh, Riverview course does become open, it would be the same as Paul Walker golf course, be $20 for 18 holes, make those the same. And uh, last but not least on the adjusted fees, this I'll give credit to uh, our HR director, uh, Aaron Holsey, as far as the, uh, the lifeguard certification. Uh, it is, in the past, it was, 20, it was $200 to get a new certification, and now it is free as long as you come work with us at the Russell Center Aquatic Center. Uh, we have to hire, uh, we'd like to hire 35. Uh, we have to hire 30. Uh, so that makes us obviously more competitive as long as they're working for us, uh, they'll get a, a fee a free uh, certification. Recertification is the same way. Somebody just works somewhere else and come back for a recertification as a lifeguard, that'll be free to them as long as they're working for us. $200 is in essence the majority of their first check, so that kind of uh, obviously makes us more attractive and uh, more competitive with that. Uh, but uh, talk quickly just so I can open up for any questions you may have. It's uh, a great idea. What happens if they leave? Uh, we don't know, we'll, we'll get that point when we get there, I suppose. Uh, it may be they don't get it until the end of the season. That we have to work through the dynamics so far. In all, in all truthfulness, at this point, we're just working through this program now. Okay. And so uh, it's something that we'll have to work through, the, through some of that. Uh, we have some attrition always in lifeguarding because you're talking about the age, their schedule changes, uh, that sort of stuff. So uh, a lot of times it's not attributable because they're some, going somewhere else. It's just other things happen that they may not continue being able to lifeguard with you. 
Uh, the thing about lifeguards is uh, any of those teenagers looking for a great first job, lifeguarding is always hiring in whatever community you go to, whatever place, and uh, there you go, that's it. <laughs> uh, but with that said, uh, so we hire lifeguards in July towards the season end just because we may have an opportunity to rehire them back in May and June of next year as well. Or so maybe it's, a prorated. That's exactly right. So it, there's always opportunities for us. In other words, we think it's a wise investment. Sure. We think it's, it's going to be much more, uh, uh, I'll put it, it's going to talk more in our favor than not. I agree. I just hate to hire yeah. a lifeguard one, right. you know, for two weeks and then they get their $200 right. and go. And the truth they're, they're not receiving money yeah. they are they used to have to pay yeah. to get their to go through the certification course and if they are if we have offered them a position we are then just waiving the fee so it's it, it we're, we're we're hiring them and then we're certifying them which um, fees through the american red cross and it, it is basically 35 dollars for three fees for three not like, out three separate fees Three separate cars, I should say. Three separate so the city was doing the certification exactly program right. for a fee. Yes, exactly. I get it. Right. Okay. It was a class. That so makes more sense. Mm -hmm. And we still do that now yeah, for lifeguards who aren't working with us. That's $200. Uh, okay. um, couple of words. What are, uh, are we doing as far as the ponds and the fairways being watered? crosswinds yes uh, number nine fountain has a uh, has to be replaced as electrical work and has to be replaced we have quotes for it so uh, I believe it'll be done within probably won't be done by the end of this month or the uh, or it definitely will be the end of this month but it I would like to think it'd be done by the end of June but we'll have to wait and see how quickly we can get that that done uh, as far as irrigating the fairways we can use city water to do that now if I mean, we have the irrigation lake and we can use city water if we had to but that we're able to, to use it, we're able to irrigate at all times. But we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really and truly, as far as irrigation comes in, same way as the soccer fields, we haven't had a huge need to irrigate until about two weeks ago. Uh, we've, we've, got, we've gotten a lot of rain up until about two weeks ago. Now's the time we have to begin ir irrigating. Bermuda grass doesn't grow until your, your low temperatures are pretty warm. So really, we haven't had the, the need to irrigate. Uh, we've had enough rain keep us green for the most majority of the time. We're not having any leaks in our ponds? That I'm aware of, no. We did have one scare on one of the, one of the ponds, but we've, we've managed to be okay for the time being, so yeah. The reason I asked, I got a call mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago pertaining to that. Talked to a neighbor this past week myself about that, and uh, uh, no, number nine is obviously our signature when you take a photo of crosswinds, that's kind of where you want to go. So we want that fountain to be working, I'll put it that way. Uh, and it's something that uh, 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 I'm dedicated to to get, get done, so it's just a matter of getting it finished. Related to parks, unrelated to fees, uh, can you tell me how many sand volleyball courts that we have and is there at least one available that's not occupied by league play? I have three sand volleyball courts at Preston Miller Park. Uh, those courts are scheduled for league play Monday through Thursday, and they are full, absolutely full. Volleyball is one of our largest uh, participant leagues. Uh, part of it is because of high school volleyball it has increased o over time, and then maybe just because people enjoy the sand, I don't know. Uh, for whatever reason that is, the reality is uh, you don't have it in this year's CIP, this year's budget, but we, we would like to add an additional three courts right behind press those current locations. Right now, uh, they are full Monday through Thursday. Friday, we don't have leagues. Saturdays, we don't have leagues. Sundays, we don't have leagues. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the Mommy and Me. Is this a new program? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Just, and it's something, uh, in the community centers with the gyms, uh, one of the things with the basketball court is during the school day, it's always tough finding a participant way to bring in people do, to the gym. This is just an opportunity for us to, when we have full-time staff for eight hours, the kids don't arrive till 2.30 and they're gone by 6 o'clock or whatever the case is, 
it just gives us an opportunity to kind of do uh, an extra program. So that, that's, their, that's their outreach for that. You know, you can do some homeschool programmings and that sort of stuff, and this is another opportunity for that. It's really a, uh, well, you can kind of, our, our staff brings out some hula hoops and some things. It's a little bit of fitness, a little bit of games, and it, it's not even an hour program really for attention span. But, uh, and the mom kind of leads some things too. It's, it's a little bit of give and take on that. It's almost like space to come and just enjoy their time together and kind of give them some props, if you will. To kind of, we'll lead a few activities, but it's not a, uh, it's definitely not a boot camp. <laughs> One final question. I'm sorry. I didn't see on the Hobson Grove or what will also be the, at Paul Walker that there is a junior fee. There is. Um, it may, there is. It's a five dollars and six dollars. I see at Crosswinds. Yeah, there is no for, membership because it's five dollars and six dollars. Thank you. That at both courses, and honestly, we think that's as cheap as anybody will ever get to use a course. So that's why we don't have a membership there. The truthness of it, Crosswinds, we don't have we don't have a member there at the junior rate either. Uh, it, even though we offer it, we don't have a member that's actually done that. We offer it though, if they choose to. Chronologically. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. <laughs> Please call the roll. No, Dinning. I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. Dinning. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2019-77. Municipal Order authorizing the mayor to execute a lease agreement with Downtown Redevelopment Authority Incorporated to lease Circus Square Park for BB&T concerts in the park. I moved. Second. Nash second by B. Brown. Mr. Miswell. This is our annual lease to do the concerts. Uh, would like to thank BB&T for continuing to be the main sponsor of these concerts. Uh, they are scheduled to run this year from June 21st to August 30th. And the park will be uh, avail available for setup from 12 p.m. And then concerts would have to need to wrap up at 11 p.m. each day. So. Uh, this is your standard uh, agreement we've done for years for Circus Square and the concerts in the park on Friday nights. Comment your question. Call the roll. Benning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2019-23. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 17 Personnel Policies of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to make administrative changes to comply with existing or proposed policy amendments. So moved. Urgent second by Denning, Mr. Miles. Aaron and I and, other, and, and Jean have been reviewing uh, some personnel it, policy issues and we are proposing these changes to Chapter 17. Uh, we will be bringing to you in the next coming weeks some new classification schedules uh, to be approved. Uh, and I'd like to ask Aaron to give you an overview of the changes we've got before you here tonight in uh, sections 1.09 through 1.12 in Chapter 17. Um, so chapter 17 is the chapter in our code of ordinance referring to any um, personnel issues and um, in the agenda for the next meeting on June 4th I will be making recommendations for the policy manual some revisions to that and as we went through that um, Jean thankfully pointed out that there were a couple of areas that were duplicated in both the policy manual as well as chapter 17 so a um, couple of cleanup items that we need to do um, tonight for the first reading and um, then the next meeting will be the second reading when we when I make those um, proposed changes to the policy manual itself um, you're, you're free to read through, but, but most of it is to reduce redundancy um, in the different policies that you all approve, the policy manual, you all approve our um, wage classification schedule, which will also be on there next week um, as well. So um, nothing is really changing um, so much as allowing us in the future to only change things in one place instead of in two places. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Dinning. Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-19. 
Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning attractive land containing 0.55 acre from RM4 multifamily residential to CB Central Business located at 1328 Adams Street. Presently owned by JNT Property Management Incorporated and Wabuck Development Company as contract vendee. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. This is a second reading of a unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning for rezoning in, in the city. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-20. Ordinance annexing right-of-way by consent. Ordinance annexing 13.895 acres of right-of-way located on US 31W between Stone Lane and Bristow Road, presently owned by the Commonwealth of Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, with said territory being contiguous to existing city limits. Moved. Second. Nash second by Perigen. The second reading of what Mr. Meisel explained to us last time for the next two uh, items, as a matter of fact. Are there any further questions or comments? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. And second reading of ordinance BG 2019-21. Ordinance annexing right-of-way by consent. Ordinance annexing 3.436 acres of right-of-way located on Lover's Lane between Old Lover's Lane and Steeplechase Way, presently owned by the Commonwealth of Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, with said territory being contiguous to existing city limits. Nash second by Denning. Again, a second reading of uh, something that was explained on last meeting. Any further comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Next we have uh, our budget presentation. Mr. Meisel. Okay, due to uh, the electric and the HVAC issues, we may not have um, power in, I'm sorry. Okay, we, you do have it on your screens, but we can't get it up there, I apologize. So anyway, we'll get started. Uh, I hope everybody's doing okay with the, with the, the temperature, but we'll try to make this Quick, um, I hope there's air conditioning in this budget. <laughs> uh, we're, we're working on it. So, first of all, I want to thank thank everyone for being here, and I want to get started by thanking our employees, our division managers, and our department heads, some of, of whom are here today. Here we go. We're we're up up now for working on this budget. This budget. Uh, process is kind of a grassroots effort starts from the employees and the, the budget uh, teams in each individual department and it and it gets it grows from there gets to the division level managers and then gets to the department heads we meet with the department heads and we we throw all this thing together and you, you get what you see here tonight I especially want to thank our budget team uh, Katie Schaller Ward our our assistant city manager city uh, CFO uh, Aaron Holsey, our HR director, Aaron Ballou, our assistant CFO, and Sean Weeks, our assistant CFO. Uh, Katie uh, oversees the entire budget process, makes everything fit together, puts all the pieces together. Aaron has worked hard on the personnel budget. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Holsey, uh, I should just call them the, the Aarons, but Aaron Ballou uh, would like to all her work on the budget document that you see before you today in your binder as well as the capital improvement project summaries and then of course Sean uh, last but not least he sets the revenue targets he's kind of the kind of the pace car so to speak for the budget when in setting our revenue forecast so the budget you have before you today uh, presents uh, a budget with no tax increases uh, this is our 17th consecutive year uh, since FY03, there has been no tax increase 
uh, either property tax or occupational taxes proposed. This is also a reduced but balanced general fund budget. You're, you're, gonna get, you're getting ready to see. Uh, it's a balanced budget in most of the other funds with a few of the capital fund, except for a few of the capital funds that reflect use of fund balances where we have saved up uh, cash reserves uh, for, for in prior years for, for projects. Uh, this budget before you also presents a what I would call per persistence and perseverance to cover the continued mandated CERS employer contribution increases that we continue to get slapped in the face with. We're, we're covering another 12% this year, which equates to a little over $900,000 to our budget. And we anticipate this to go on. You'll see a slide here in a few minutes. This will go on for at least another three years. So there's a five-year phase in. We'll show you that in just a few minutes, but that, that's a big, big chunk that we uh, absorb in this general fund budget. Uh, there are no new debt issues planned except for the fire improvement fund to issue debt for, for two trucks coming up. And of course we have continued to place effort on our debt reduction and we're currently at a little over $70 million outstanding debt. You strip away the ballpark, you strip away the trans park, you strip away the WKU bonds and we're probably somewhere between 15 and $20 million in outstanding debt, which is outstanding uh, if you ask any financial advisor. Um, beyond that, you'll see in a few minutes, we have made some adjustments on the revenue side in order to set realistic and attainable funding levels. Uh, budget, the way we go about things, we may be kind of backwards compared to the federal level and the state level but we look at what we think our revenues are going to be. Then we start looking at our operating expenditures, what they need to be, covering personnel, debt, all the, the basic core things. Then we start looking at what can we afford on COLAs, what we can afford on step increases, what we can afford on capital, and so on. And we, get, we, we work that thing down. Uh, Katie's got a, a spreadsheet that works that thing down to zero. And we always try to get to zero and we get to a balanced budget each year, for the, especially for the general fund. Like the stock market, uh, robust growth can't last forever. And so there are retractions and, and that will occur. And this year is somewhat one of those years where we're gonna kind of let off the throttle a little bit on, on the, in the general fund with revenues. You'll see that here in just a second. Uh, Katie, Aaron, and Aaron will also explain how they have worked to get the operating expenditure budgets, the personnel budget, and the capital project budgets in line with those revenue projections. Uh, we also believe this budget addresses the strategic goals that you all have set in place. Uh, more jobs, a diverse economy. We, we're going to, con to continue to use the job development incentive program to incentivize new and expanding businesses to get to come to Bowling Green. Uh, improve traffic flow. Uh, we're we're going to do that on all the roads and streets that we control. A vibrant downtown and river view, riverfront uh, improvements are in process as we can see today. Uh, sustain, sustain, sustainable city government, uh, having affordable operating budgets, uh, and then strong neighborhoods. We're going to continue with our neighborhood improvement projects um, pro program. Modernized infrastructure, we're working in partnership with our telecommunications and utilities to improve our infrastructure in those areas. This upcoming budget, we continue our commitments to giving the citizens a good return on their tax dollars by growing revenues without increasing tax rates, uh, maintaining and improving current level of services, sustaining an aggressive overlay program, same level investment. Uh, you can see that out there this last couple of weeks, all of the overlay work that's being done. I drove up College Street today from all the way from about third all the way to six that's being overlaid today. Uh, continued focus on stormwater mitigation, same level of budget investment there. Enhancement of our community walkability, same level investment with our sidewalks. And then of course the continued implementation of our parks master plan with our parks improvements. This budget covers all of our financial obligations, uh, provides some relief for the increase in demand for services through additional police officers, additional firefighters to staff the Lovers Lane Fire Station, to maintain our public safety, to protect life and property in, in the city. Uh, we are funding uh, for replacement of our 911 CAD system at our dispatch center. Uh, we're funding for new road projects that will help alleviate traffic congestion. 
uh, improvements to our parks facilities to enhance quality of life, uh, provide for better efficiencies with technology enhancements and, and investments in our IT department. And then we're going to invest in our human capital uh, to continue to provide all the services expected by our citizens. Uh, as in previous years, we'll be presenting this today uh, as a team approach collaboratively. Everyone will have their own solo performances uh, when they step up to the, to the microphone. Sean's going to start us out with the revenue budget uh, presentation. Katie's going to then come up and, and present to you the expenditures. Uh, Aaron will then, Aaron Holsey will present to you the personnel section of the budget. And then Aaron Ballou will come up and present to you the capital improvement uh, program CIP budget along with debt service uh, and one slide on fund balance to show you where we're at there and then finally Katie's going to return and, and close it out with agency funding and uh, so I ask you to just uh, sit back and relax and we should be done by 930 or so so just it, just it, kidding just kidding we need, just kidding Joe yeah, I know you are <laughs> you thank you Joe <laughs> Mayor and Commissioners, um, I would like to present the revenue portion of the FY20 budget. Um, as Jeff said, we took a conservative approach um, coupled with a recalibration to bring revenues back in line with expected results. This helps with setting the expenditure budget. It provides a margin of error during the year by staying conservatively in case we come in over we're able to, to reappropriate those if possible. The revenue budget is based on nine months of actual revenue and that's projected out for the final three months. So essentially, this is the estimate of where we feel that the city will finish the year out, plus any possible sustainable growth in certain areas. So I'm going to fo focus on the revenue portion of this table before you. Revenue for all funds is projected at approximately $122.2 million, which is a 2.3% decrease compared to the FY19 adopted budget of 125.1. The general fund revenue, including golf and aquatics, comes in at $72.25 million or a 2.5% decrease versus FY19. Some of the background for the recalibration of the revenues. In FY17, the general fund actually grew 7.6% over FY16. It also outpaced our adopted budget by $5.3 million, which was pretty staggering at the time. So in FY18, the budget was set to make up for that growth by increasing by 6.8% over the FY17 budget. But revenues still outperformed that budget by another $1.3 million. So with FY18 revenues on track to show that continued growth, which outdid the historical norms, the FY19 budget was set at 6.6% over that FY18 budget to catch up to that two-year growth. That was prevalent. This was prevalent before the final net profit numbers came in. When FY18 was tallied, however, it only beat out FY17 by a mere $29,000. So another great year, you know, one of our, one of our top years we've ever had. However, the growth flattened out. Um, so with FY19 um, numbers predicated on that growth that we had seen for the previous 21 months, we're, able to, we're trying to knock that down just a bit to get back to norms. All of this is to say that FY19 general fund budget, we project to finish about $72.5 million, and thus recalibration is included. This figure is still a projected 2.4% increase over the FY18 actuals, with the budget conservatively set uh, at flat totals based on occupational trends that we are seeing. As Jeff stated, I want to note that the negative shown here on this page is not deficit spending, but use of funds earmarked for capital projects and planned spending of fund balance. Um, this shows kind of the comparison of, of revenue by type for all funds across the board. Um, the taxes portion includes property taxes, insurance premium taxes for both general fund and our fire improvement fund. Occupational fees are represented by the general fund, the parks development fund, which is the Heartland Taxing District, and the job development fund. License and permits refers to building, plan review, and electrical permits. The intergovernmental portion are grants across, across multiple funds like transit, the housing choice voucher program, CDBG, liquid fuel, and others. The majority of the fees are represented by WKU reimbursement for Diddle Arena bonds. We've never been out any funds since we are reimbursed for those costs. <laughs> Under charges for services, uh, the major portion are fleet lease rates that the fleet division charges each division for their maintenance of, of their vehicles and equipment, and also cemetery receipts. 
Parks and Rec, Rec encompasses general parks, golf, and aquatics. The miscellaneous portion are health insurance premiums, interest earned, police and fire pension earnings, contributions, donations, and rental income. You know of the, the largest changes on the right that two of the four largest changes above are occupational fees and license and permits, which occur mostly in the general fund. And we'll discuss those shortly. The 22.2% growth in miscellaneous is due to an employer premium increase to account for fixed costs under the health care fund. And the 24.9% decrease in the transfers in portion is a reflection of the, re of the reduction of revenues available for pre-funding of capital projects in conjunction with increased operating costs. So these two pie charts kind of show you kind of the percentage of resources for the all funds and the general fund. Just want to note a couple of the percentages that occupational fees is 44.1% of our collections in all funds. Taxes are at 16.3% with transfers in at 137 On the general fund side, withholdings and net profits encompass 69.6% of all collections that we receive. Property insurance premium taxes are 22.7%. Um, and the occupational fee portion has been at or above the 70% since FY 2011. This ne next chart gives you kind can of I a history. Sorry, of can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Is it okay to ask if we have a clarifying question when he's presenting on a particular thing or should I wait Go till the it. end? Okay. Go for it. Um, so how big a percentage is net profits of that portion of what we that collect? That portion, uh, net profits is around $10 million. And you have employee withholdings is, is the other portion of that. So we were around $40 million. So the percentage is, is what is that, like 20%? Thank you. Yep. Um, so occupational fees have been 70% since FY11 on the next slide here. Um, seven years of historical adopted revenues. And FY15, golf and aquatics, aquatics was added to the general fund, which provided the jump in growth. So FY15 through FY19 showed steady growth with FY19 being the highest point at $74.1 million and FY20 reflecting the resetting of the revenues to match the expected collection, collections at $72.3 million. So this is a 10-year history of the general fund revenues and the apportionment of the occupational revenues of that. Um, starting in 2012, continued growth was shown um, well, first, 2011 was the effect of the recession at its lowest point. Started in 2012, continued growth was showed until FY18 when we had flat growth that I spoke about earlier, with an average increase of 5.2% for total revenues across that period. For occupational receipts, we also had a 5.2% average growth increase in until 2018 when we had a small 1.2% decline in occupationals to finish out that year. Projection for FY20 is basically flat in both occupationals and overall general fund totals against the finish of FY19 that we were projecting. On to the net profit history. You'll notice kind of an interesting pattern here that on the each odd year is higher than the preceding even year. Part of the reason are estimated overpayments um, collected in the odd years carried forward and applied to, to the next period, which aren't new revenues. Um, also, we have refund requests for some of those overpayments that are estimated. So you see that in the, in the following years. The even growth years average actually 12.8% growth if you compare even year to even year as we go up, where the odd years have a 10.7% um, growth rate. For, FY, for fiscal year 20, we're projecting um, $9.1 million, which is the same as FY19, and a 2.2% conservative growth over the FY18 even year for comparison purposes. Um, on to the general fund analysis, um, we're gonna take a look at property taxes in, in each piece. So our budget for total property taxes reflects the growth of 5.9% over the FY19 adopted budget and 2.1% over estimated ca uh, actual collections. This growth, is not, this growth is not based on any sort of tax increases, but changes in assessment for real property, growth in annexed areas, and new development added to the tax roll. Under property taxes, that includes real, personal, motor vehicle, franchise taxes, and payments in lieu of or pilot taxes. The other taxes portion increased by 5.2% over FY19 adopted budget related to insurance premium taxes and bank franchise taxes. Also included in that total are telecommunication franchise taxes, but we're projecting flat growth with, with no growth there. 
so our largest source of revenue for the general fund, yeah, it's on, on point. Our largest source of revenue for the general fund are occupational fees consisting of employee wage withholdings and net profits. The top line represents 1.5% of the 1.85 total fees. The second line are the service enhancement fees, which represent 0.35% of the 1.85 in order for the city to track what revenues were generated when it was increased from 1.5% to 2.0% back in 2003 and then brought back down in 2007 to 1.85. So it's all the portions above the 1.5 base. The budget decrease reflects a 5.7% decrease versus FY19 adopted budget with a modest 0.3% increase over projected FY19 estimates. What is the point of continuing to track them differently? I think if, if we ever want to do any reductions or increases, that shows kind of what we've tracked in the past. And we were we originally earmarked those for certain um, growths um, within the piece. And so we can see if, if there's any changes, we want to keep that original base together. Thank you. Um, it also is a 0.2% projected increase over FY18 actuals, which allows us to reset occupational totals, projected levels going forward, and do account for market changes, as Jeff mentioned. Do you have any idea how much, if you, and it could even be speculation, do you think that we're losing in private contractors who aren't paying the occupational tax? It's really hard to say. You know, you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, you know, you have this, the some that come in really briefly and are, and are gone. Those are the ones that are hard to hit. You know, they might come in on a weekend, they might come in in the evening. So those are the ones that are hard to, to hit. We actually, in FY19, are going to be adding a business license inspector soon, a second one. Um, that's out right now, and we've been going through the application, so we hope to add that very soon and present that to you shortly. Um, we're hoping also to that individual maybe to have some nighttime and maybe a weekend on occasion to be able to hit those pieces that we're currently missing that are harder to, to get. So, so I think that's a portion of the ones that, are, that we are missing, but we're hoping to be able to, to catch up on, on some of those by adding second inspector when maybe they, they might know a routine and we're trying to cover a larger portion of the area with that second inspector. So I think that will allow for, for those pieces that are slipping through the cracks currently. Jeff, if you can remind me, the one inspector that we have collected what in the last year do you remember what those numbers are? Nine hundred thousand. Right. Uh, it's it's in the millions since we've we created that position back in 08, I think oh seven or oh eight. It's it's more than paid for itself, but uh, it, it levels the playing field um, for the businesses that have been here for twenty years and have been paying their taxes and doing all the right things and following the rules versus the ones that don't follow the rules and they come in and try to sneak away so um, we think this will address that and uh, level the playing field and, and we might find some additional revenues as well we've had a couple of large shortfall uh, not shortfalls windfalls for some large things that were found and that um, we got revenue for three or four more years while um, construction or other implementation of certain things within certain companies so it's, it's definitely been a boon, and like Jeff said, Jeff said, I think it will pay for itself for the second inspector and, and, and give us a boost in our revenues, hopefully. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to the uh, license of permits. Again, that consists of building permits, electrical and plan review, as well as alcohol beverage licenses. FY19 is projected to finish at 19.4% of FY19 adopted budget um, on the backs of strong building and plan review permits. FY20, however, is a modest 1.1% growth over FY19 estimated actuals. Um, we're seeing a small slowing trend in the last few months, so we want to make sure that we're cautious and conservative. Um, the grants portion is only represented by the county reimbursement for the Lover's Lane Soccer Complex, their portion of that. All other grants are budgeted in special revenue funds and a couple other funds from there. The spike that you see there in the 2019 uh, actuals is a few different grants um, in FY19, one of which is year one of three of the SAFER grant, which pays for 75% of reimbursement for nine fire personnel. Also included is Kentucky 911 Services Board grant for the 911 phone system upgrade and Kentucky Lar Libraries and Archives grant for microfilming. Um, we'll carry forward the budget balance for the SAFER grant for year two of three into FY20, and then year three of three will also forward on to FY2021. So there's no new 
uh, budget for FY20 for those pensions because we'll carry it forward. The general fund revenue now is on the charges for services side and parks and rec. So under charges for services, we have cemetery receipts, school tax collection fees, and cost recovery fees for our public safety personnel. The 6.8% increase relates primarily to school tax collection fees, of which the city receives 2% of school property tax collections, which we remit back to the city schools. And then the other portion of the increase relates to reimbursement for cost of our use of our public safety personnel at events. Parks and Rec encompasses golf, general parks like community centers and athletic le leagues, golf, and aquatics. The adjustment of negative 4.5% to Parks and Rec is for golf, reflecting a closure to Riverview, allowing for reconfigurations and aquatics to be in line with the current projected revenue. Under miscellaneous and transfers in, miscellaneous encompasses uh, interest earned, rental income, sale of equipment through our Gov, Gov Deals website. Um, parking tickets, contributions, donations, and judgments and settlements. With 6.8% growth over FY19 adopted budget and 4.8% over the FY19 estimated actuals, the gains are primarily from interest earnings leading the charge. The transfers in portion simply refers to the golf's apportionment of the Heartland tax and district revenues that go back into the golf fund. So this is kind of a recap of everything that I talked about and the, the changes for each portion um, we're projecting a negative 2.5% decrease in the FY20 recommended general fund budget versus the FY19 adopted, or a 0.3% decrease versus what we're estimating FY19 to finish at. This is virtually a flat change in order to reset the revenues back to expected results the remainder of this year. When comparing against the final high water mark of FY18, this is a modest 2.1% increase over that fiscal year. This brings the city in line with the current outlook and projections after a flat finish in FY18 and a modest projected growth in FY19. So we're trying to, to keep it even par. That's, that's all I have for you guys. You guys have any questions I can answer um, before I turn it over to Katie to talk about expenditures? Any questions for uh, Just one more follow-up question around the net profits. Um, so if we're from the April report, yes. um, if I remember correctly, we were down 1.7 million at this point. Uh, and it's 20% of our total, you know, our biggest chunk that we get our money from. Let me, let me stop you there. Was I incorrect there? there? Was I mess up on the 20? It's more like 12%. Oh, uh, that's my fault. Okay. Between, <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to add the service enhancement okay. fees we're to it in my head. We're usually around 57, 58% yeah. withholdings and another 11 or 12% in the past net profits to make up, to, to get to about 71, 72. Now that we're down to 69, it may be a little, it's 1% less, but you're looking more like an 11 or 12% uh, portion of your general fund revenue for net correction. profits. Thank you for that correction, Jeff. Well, I apologize for popping. No, that no, no, that's okay. That's okay. The, <laughs> let me, I gotta find where that slide was where I had my question. I was trying to wait till the end, and now I'm not efficient with your time, and I apologize. Hold on, where were we? Um, Anyway, just checking in on the pro projections in terms of are you assuming the same amount of gap between where we were at April 9, 18 um, for next year, or how are you calculating that in in terms of our projections for? From a projection standpoint, we like to see kind of where we are at the time and then kind of add up, kind of look at a, a combination of previous year's history to kind of add to that. So if we're kind of ahead of the game early, that kind of gives us a head start and kind of when we average that together, Plus, we also take a look at kind of where we are during the year percentages-wise down and kind of uh, incorporate that in. Um, I think as, as, as Katie had mentioned um, in conversations that we were a little understaffed, so we're kind of a little bit behind on the net profits. We hope to see that kind of, kind of gain there and see that kind of come up from that $1.7 million decrease that you're seeing. I think we're, we're a little bit behind the eight ball, but the staff has been, been working very hard to kind of get that up since we've been a little bit short staffed. So I hope to see that gain and come up because uh, if, you, if we look back at the chart, um, FY20 uh, is, our, is our kind of our, our down year, right? So typically so. So thank you for going back to that slide. That's where my question yeah. was. So, so if this is supposed to be our up year. And this is supposed to be our up year. Yeah. Or, and it's only a teeny tiny bit up. Right. What does that mean for 
next year well, when we go I'm, down and I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the flat growth there right okay because we saw that quite a bit of dip mm -hmm. um, so it's only a, a, a two hundred thousand dollar increase over the FY 18 uh, budget so we're, we're keeping that flat growth um, I'm not trying to project anything any increase at all I'm, I'm keeping it the same but I guess if we know the odd year or the even years are down why are we not going down but, but if you're already each, down for 2019 if you look at each even year Mm -hmm. They've all increased from the previous even year. So we've not had any, we've, we don't it. have any projections where that has happened in the past from a trending perspective. Mm -hmm. So instead of projecting that growth that I talked about, which was like about like 13% or 11% for the even years and 10% for the odds, I'm projecting no growth at all. So, so that's where I'm building in that conservative nature by not projecting the growth that we've seen trending for all of the previous even years. Thank you. This, yes, this budget is always challenging because we only have nine months uh, to base it on uh, by the time we put all this together we only have numbers through march maybe april some years if we're late and so we still have may and june that we have no idea may could be a blockbuster month june could be too but we always look back at the prior year what happened those last three months of last year and and sean takes that in, into consideration so and with net profits being due on 415 we don't really have much to go by when it comes to you know if if we're going to be increasing our collections um so, so our april it, report did not include what's that the april report did it, not it, include it the included a portion thereof but some of that bleeds into may typically okay. especially with a little bit less staff to be able to process those okay. um so we hope by the end of may and even a little bit into june that we should be able to process the backlog of those net profits and truly see where we'll finish the year and see how our projections go but we have to have a stopping point and have to be and have to go against trends from previous years to be able to base our budget on okay thank you very much any other questions i'll turn it over to katie shaw good afternoon I apologize to the audience that our projector is not working we do have money in the budget to replace both projectors uh, this year forthcoming so it's my responsibility to talk to you about the expenditure side of the equation from the graphics that are on the slide and hopefully you all have those uh, there are some extra copies of the presentation in the back of the room I don't know that there's enough for everyone but there are some back there we are noticing that, uh, and this is the same slide that was shown at the very beginning that Sean started out the conversation on the revenues. Uh, it also reflects our expenditure budget. And we are recommending to budget less in FY 2020 for both the all funds and the general fund budget. As Sean had talked about the revenues, the expenses are gonna fall in line with that same process. <clears throat> for all funds, we propose to decrease the expenses by just under $3 million or 2.3% and use just over $2.5 million of previously saved money, as has already been mentioned, um, for our all fund capital projects and purchases. This is the sixth consecutive year that we have not proposed to use any general fund fund balance to balance the budget. So we are proposing a even revenue and expenditure budget. And this budget is one8 million dollars or 2.5 percent less than the fy19 budget again it falls right in line with the revenues if you note on the fiscal year 2019 adjusted budget it looks like we're going to hit fund balance by about 3.3 million dollars much of that is from project carry forwards from the previous year and capital projects which we carried forward those monies we weren't able to spend in a previous year so we've already budgeted for those expenditures we're already anticipating those expenses so we're not anticipating to impact fund balance in any way plus we believe that we're going to finish this year's expenditure budget under the 75 million dollar revenue adjustment that we're looking at This is a comparison um, of our all funds budget and we break it out by category or by type. And as just stated, when comparing the FY20 all funds recommended budget to the FY19 adopted budget, total expenses will be down. By looking more closely at the different expenditure categories, 
This almost $3 million decrease is reflected specifically in our contractual services, our debt service, and our transfers out. The $4 million decrease in contractual services is directly related to one-time capital purchases, which were budgeted in FY19. And the $748,000 decrease in debt service ties back to the retirement of our convention center bonds and our depot lease, which were paid off this fiscal year. The nearly $5 million decrease in transfers out is from a decrease in our general fund transfer out for capital projects. The factors involved with the increase in the personnel will be discussed later in the presentation. The combined $2.3 million increase in supplies and fixed assets can be attributed to proposed capital projects and purchases for FY18, which is also going to be discussed later in the presentation. The $731,290 increase in subsidies and assistance comes from multiple factors. In the all funds budget, we have our housing choice voucher program, which has utility assistance, landlord payments, and increased portability payments of about $159,000 going into the next fiscal year. We also have some additional uh, anticipated expenses toward our downtown TIF distributions and then our agency funding adjustments, which I'll discuss at the end of the presentation. Excluding capital items, the all fund operating budget is up 4% or 3.9 million compared to the fiscal year 19 operating budget. <clears throat> Again, just in line with how we presented the ex uh, revenue side, we wanna show you how the expenditures equate out into are different pieces of the pie. Public safety expenditures make up 39.9% of the all funds budget and 42.9% of the general fund. In the all funds budget, the other departments combined account for 42.5% with a balance of 26.6% coming from the transfers out, intergovernmental agency services and contingency. For the general fund, the other departments combined account for 37.2%, and when I refer to the other departments, I refer to everything other than public safety. So general government, parks and rec, public works, our neighborhood and community services, those are the other combined departments I'm referring to. So that's 37.2% in general fund, and then 19.9% is what rounds out the rest of that pie, which is the transfers out, debt service, intergovernmental and agency services and contingency. Any questions? Okay. Again, this, this particular graph looks identical to the revenue side because we are showing a balanced budget and have shown a balanced budget for the last several years. So this graph, uh, graph reflects the total adopted budget amounts for the past few years. In FY15, as Sean had mentioned, we did incorporate the golf and aquatics into the general fund, so we had the revenue and we had the expenditure. And the rise from FY16 to FY19 was mostly reflective in our capital improvement program. Again, we have the revenues in order to have the capital improvement program be a little bit more robust in those years. With FY2020, we're specifically decreasing our capital investment in order to bring our budget back in line and present the balanced budget. As the expenditure budget is prepared, we take great pains in making sure that we are providing to you the most appropriate budget that we can present. Um, all the departments know I review each and every request that is presented. We look at historical trends, we look at needs, uh, and we look at where we think we're going to need to be in the next few years, and we adjust the budget accordingly. So not every department gets everything that they request. We have to make sure everything falls in line with the revenues we have available. When you take into account the projected revenues and previous, as were pre previously presented, the FY20 recommended general fund budget covers all operating costs and proposes to include capital improvements of over $4.8 million without impacting fund balance. I, we keep repeating that, but that's a very important statement. Since the general fund accounts for 58% of the all funds budget, I'm gonna provide a little bit more detail into the general fund expenditures just as Sean had done with the revenue side. This particular graph identifies our most expensive uh, personnel expense compared to all expenditures and shows that personnel expenses contribute to over 62.2% of the general fund budget 
for FY20 as we move forward and reflects how slowly personnel expenses have grown over the last several years. And when our HR director comes up and, and presents that information, I think she'll have some more information about that. All right, can you explain that to me again? The yellow is our personnel costs. Yes. And then the, the blue, blue. The other bar is total expenses. So it's okay. comparing personnel costs, our largest, largest expense in the general fund, to all costs. Again, because personnel is a significant portion of our general fund budget, um, I've broken out for you some of the key parts of what makes up personnel expenditures. And personnel is up 9.2% compared to FY19 adopted budget. And again, the additional details contributing behind these changes will be presented shortly. Uh, just to clarify, other personnel costs, that particular line includes the employer's portion, the city's portion of medical, dental, vision, life, and health benefit insurance premiums, workers' comp, and unemployment services, expenses, I'm sorry. And then the um, total other benefits line includes uh, primarily our tuition reimbursement program at about $55,000 but then some small amounts for cell phone stipend reimbursements, some ENT re EMT recertification reimbursements, and a new referral program for police and dispatchers. So again, breaking out the pie a little bit more, we're gonna look at contractual services, and they're only up by $91,000, and that's primarily because uh, we added almost $49,000 to contract some of our mowing services moving forward for our parks department, as well as increases in utilities, software maintenance, public safety education and travel, vehicle maintenance fees, and other various accounts, including the mandated $10,000 increase on our PVA assessment fee that we have to pay. Uh, that was not in the FY19 budget, although we had to pay it um, just this last summer. Uh, so we will have to obviously budget for that for FY20. The $140,000 increase in supplies comes um, from adding $57,000 in material costs for some every other year expenses we have with uh, street maintenance, uh, namely curb painting, and then purchasing some additional replacement parts for our traffic detection equipment. Can I ask a question related to that? Mm -hmm. Since we just um, made that agreement with the state around adopting their streets, will that increase our every other year maintenance on those streets as well? I believe that was for sidewalks? Yes, but and I didn't know if that related yet. to... No. No, okay. Again, this is an every other year cost, so hopefully next year that $57,000 will not be in the budget, um, but it'll probably go towards something else. Uh, we've also uh, proposing to increase our ammunition supplies for the police department because we want to have at least one year of supplies on hand. That's about $25,000 increase. Uh, we had $41,000 to outfit eight new proposed public safety positions, which again, we'll go into more detail in a few minutes. $10,000 to replace the two projectors in this room. Uh, nearly $20,000 in other public safety equipment and subscription costs to assist with firefighting and crime solving. That makes up the $140,000. The decrease in fixed assets relates back to the FY19 one-time capital, equipment purchases being more than what we're proposing for FY20. Most notably, the um, scene reconstruction equipment that we purchased for police department, that was 59,500 in the FY19 budget, so we don't have that expense moving forward and we don't have as much in assets presented for the FY20 capital budget. Of the $600,000 increase in our subsidies and assistance, as I previously mentioned, $425,000 of that is for an anticipated increase in our downtown TIF distribution. And we have to budget nearly $200,000 for the city's portion of a grant match for uh, improvements at the airport. The Federal Aviation Administration grant requires a local match of 2.1%. This project is expected to be about $8 million. The amount of funds set aside to cover any unforeseen expenses during the year has a very small adjustment under miscellaneous, and I mean small, $280. And that's essentially just to balance our budget. We try to have about 1% of the general fund budget available 
for contingency to help cover those things that happened during the year that we didn't anticipate or budget for. In this case, it's around $725,000, $730,000. The $5.8 million decline in transfers out, as previously mentioned, again, is directly related to reducing our general fund supported capital improvement projects compared to FY19. And when you look back to the FY19 budget, uh, some of those CIP projects included um, $3 million that we had pre-funded to avoid debt issuance on the construction of a new fire station, and about $1.7 million in Parks Capital Projects, which now will be supported by the Parks Development Fund since the Heartland Taxing District will be eliminated now that the debt is paid off. And so the, by ordinance, the Parks Development Fund, those funds go toward golf operating expenses and Parks Capital Projects. And then there's $1.3 million less in road projects that we're presenting next year as we're trying to ramp up and kind of pre-fund and save for future projects, yes. You said that the Heartland Taxing District goes away because the convention center was paid for. Yes, the bonds are paid off, so the taxing district will be eliminated. We'll have some action by the board to amend our code of ordinances for that particular taxing district in the next couple of meetings, I guess. Um, but there was previously, before the Heartland Taxing District was established, there was something called the Heartland Planned Community, which includes the taxing district and the residential development around the golf course. So that money was dedicated as part of the parks development fund to pay for operating expenditures and capital improvements for the golf, for Heartland Golf and the other golf courses, as well as any additional funds could go toward parks capital projects. That's by ordinance. Does that clarify your question? You still have a puzzled look. I jump in here. <clears throat> Similar to the Corvette Museum, there was a special tax district around the Corvette Museum that ended years ago. Uh, basically, it's it's uh, it's more or less a TIF. You're you're calculating incremental taxes from years ago, and so all we're saying is that that ends, and so 100% of those existing revenues, 80% of those no longer have to go to the convention center. Those can be uh, sent to the parks development fund or whatever use we find for them. Well, it's not so, that the revenue goes away. It's that the, the distribution on the revenue goes yes, away. Yes, the distribution goes away, much like the Corvette Museum District. Those are now our general fund tax dollars that we do not have to distribute to the Corvette Museum. The dedication Light bulb just came on. Thank yeah, you. The dedication of the funds <laughs> goes away. <laughs> I just but the only ding. people who, who pay it are who are part of that planned community? Well, everyone pays the taxes. It's just the occupational fees collected and the property taxes collected in that area are dedicated toward the Parks Development Fund. Okay. Got it. So excluding capital expenditures, the FY20 general fund operating budget reflects an increase of 7.4% or 4.6 million, the majority of which is related to personnel proposed changes that we have. And Human Resources Director Aaron Halsey will now come forward to present those proposed personnel expenditure changes in more detail. I have an airport question that I don't know when to ask. We will discuss agency funding at the end. Will that, is it something that can wait? Did you say that there is an $8 million capital improvement project at the airport? They are proposing to do an $8 million capital improvement project to reconstruct the taxiway alpha. They're going to apply for a federal FAA grant, which will provide 90% of the funding. And then um, the state provides, I believe, 10% and, no, I'm sorry, 5%. And then the city and the county provide the other 5%, so it's 2.5% each. So my question is, how long is the, if we're, and I realize we as the city are not spending $8 million, but we as the taxpayers are spending $8 million, uh, maybe not city taxpayers, but all taxes, that's what funds the airport. Uh, how, how long is the, light, is the airport likely to remain there? I don't have an answer to that. For our lifetime? 
Okay. But if you'd move, we would still, by law, have the same uh, obligation, wouldn't we? Yeah. Very likely. I'm not arguing the obligation. I was just wondering, are we spending $8 million on a capital improvement project on a piece of land that we may not be operating as an airport Maybe. for long enough to get the value of $8 million out of it? Maybe a subdivision. I suspect I that the airport will still be here long after I'm gone. Okay. What about Joe? In that location. Um, maybe longer. I don't know. Okay. I'll go okay. Karen? I feel like on every slide, Katie set me up to be the spender of money. <laughs> um, so hopefully I can... Um, uh, portray this in a way that um, allows you to see that it's um, certainly a good spend of money on the um, employees um, of the city of Bowling Green. So um, this is my first time presenting to you um, as the HR director and um, I was just reflecting on how grateful I have been of my predecessor Mike Grubbs who um, put together a very good um, presentation and was very organized and, and left very good instructions and I've been very grateful to my co-committee members of the budget committee they've taught me a lot they've tolerated a lot of questions um, and and so I'm, I'm grateful for their assistance and onboarding um, me to this process so um, here's here's my first attempt at presenting to you <laughs> um, it will not be hard on you is your first time. Will give me a pass this year. Yeah. I appreciate next year, that. Next year, look out. Well, we better have the air conditioning finished by next year so that Amen. we're not all so warm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, first off, you see um, our, our basic overall slide on our personnel expenses. The total impact for the um, FY20 fiscal year is 4.8 on the general fund, 5 million on, on all funds. And that is a combination of raises for full-time, part-time, and seasonal employees. Um, we have some new positions, nine new positions that we'll be asking for. We have eight reclassifications we will be requesting. And as you've heard many times tonight, we have to pay for additional um, increases with CERS rates. And um, we also have increased the employer premiums um, for insurance. I will explain that a little bit later in the presentation. For our citizens who might be listening on a video, would you explain what SIRS is just so moving forward we know what that acronym means? That is um, the portion that we pay towards retirement for city employees, part of the Kentucky retirement system. That is um, the section of that, that that we are a part of. So. Good question. Um, all right, I'm going backwards. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this is um, a slide to show the comparison of our largest revenue source, which is our occupational fees, and our largest expenditure type, which is our personnel expenses. Um, you've seen that, um, 45 million. Um, recommended for FY 2020 and this is kind of what we want to look at to make sure we're in line we always want to make sure that we are bringing in a little bit more in our occupational fees that we're spending in personnel um, and from month to month we continue to look and to make sure that um, the occupational fees are a little bit ahead so that's to show you um, where we are we're, we're continuing to spend a little bit less than we're bringing in in that area um, one of our um, most important thing to our employees is to be able to make a cost of living adjustment. We refer to that as a COLA, and we generally follow the Department of Local Government Consumer Price Index to let us know what that adjustment should be. In past years, we have tried to give at least um, the, the DLG's um, percent, and we use that for the prior calendar year. So we're basing this off the 2018 calendar year. Um, which is um, 1.9, 
and that is what we are recommending to increase all current city employees um, salaries and that is also we will then include that with um, our actual wage schedules which you will see um, in the future meeting with with our um, the rest of our budget um, and you can see there in the past what we have done and and this year it's fairly consistent the next page talks a little bit about our step and merit increases um, in most of our classification schedules the step increases are built in um, the public safety schedules the general schedule um, overall we have an average of 1.35 across the workforce depending on which pay scale uh, our employees fall on generally speaking um, there's a slightly higher percent the earlier on people are on their schedule um, and that's because it's it's the same dollar rate for the grade so as you get a little bit higher in, it just becomes a slightly smaller percentage um, throughout throughout the tenure in the grade We have a pretty large group of part-time and seasonal workers that we would not be able to um, have a, a city as beautiful as it is in the summertime and to be able to conduct as many wonderful parks programs that we do. So we certainly depend on our part-time employees um, for many of the amenities that we um, appreciate in the city. We are looking for a 20 cent an hour increase on the part-time pay schedule and so that is also about a 1.9 percent cost of living adjustment um, <clears throat> on this slide you can see a couple of the examples the the biggest groups of part-timers that we have um, such as our lifeguards and school crossing guards at 1055 laborers and greenskeepers at 1170 um, we also are going to provide a step increase of 15 cent to current part-time workers um, so combined it will be 35 cents for those who um, are current work part-time employees who've worked with us for at least a year um, we do have some classification changes that we are recommending so generally a upgrade or a reclass as we might call it um, is when we um, typically the process that happens is in the early stages of the budget process um, an employee or department head might identify an employee or a job position um, that needs to be looked at either the person has taken on new responsibilities they have gotten some more education and training they have taken on some supervisory responsibilities um, or the, the department has been a little bit reorganized we may also look at some some market information um, for those and the department head will then submit that as part of the budget process and, and we will review um, some of those requests we did have 12 requests this year and um, we are, are approving and recommending eight of those um, that will affect seven actual positions with eight people um, because we did add the business license inspector in this current year we don't currently have somebody hired yet but that is the only position that is being upgraded where there are two individuals in the position we are recommending nine new positions for the next fiscal year eight of those nine positions are in public safety five of those are in the police department um, police department depends to break those up three of them will be on patrol one will be a sergeant to the training department and one is going to be the police officer that is assigned to Bowling Green High School um, the presentation which you all have previously seen in addition to that as you've heard mentioned we do need to hire three more firefighters um, to properly staff the lovers lane um, fire station that will open hopefully next spring early summer and that will allow um, the station to have a four firefighter complement on each shift um, having those additional firefighters will also help reduce overtime within the department the last one is a GIS technician. Um, currently with the city, we only have one um, GIS manager and, and he manages pretty much all of it, um, which is, uh, it's a huge job. And um, lately we've been finding just not able to keep up with um, the basic maintenance. He, he's not able to do the larger project. So we'll be adding this GIS, GIS technician um, to work under the GIS manager and, and hopefully be able to pick up some of those areas that we haven't been able to do recently. Um, in addition to that, we were also adding to our part-time staff. 
Um, three of those are going to be parks laborers. Um, one in particular um, is going to be designated to um, replacing one of our permanent part-time individuals who switches to cover aquatics in the summer, covering the um, water sampling and making sure that we're maintaining the water properly in the three water parks is pretty ter pretty much turns into a full-time job and so we lose him on, on the landscape and mowing so that's one individual that needs to be replaced and, and that's a seasonal position um, these all are seasonal and the other two we were continuing to expand our green space our parks the new soccer fields whatnot um, we we need um, some more seasonal laborers to to help maintain those areas and then the other four individuals that we're going to be adding also to parks are recreational staff assistant ones and we would like to expand our summer camps next year uh, they the, the summer camps fill very quickly I, I hear within um, a couple of hours and so this will allow us to expand um, those camps um, by 40 children I believe so So Katie's really big on history, and I love that she has this slide in here. Um, this is showing us what I think is pretty interesting compared to the growth that we talk about. Um, it shows that over the past 10 years, um, we have actually only added 64 staff to, um, uh, to, to our city. And while that seems like a lot, just a, a couple reminders is that in the last 10 years, we've seen about 16% of growth in Bowling Green. Um, but in comparison, that's only, it, it's under a 9% growth in staff over that same period of time. Um, we've gone from 9.4 full-time employees for every 1,000 residents to 8.9 full-time employees to every 1,000 residents over that 10-year span. Um, the cost of personnel has gone up significantly, about 52%. Um, despite having pretty modest colas, we've been about 2% um, throughout those last years. We've done eight consecutive years of step increases. We did freeze step increases for two years, FY10 and FY11. Um, so just really wanna draw the impact of the retirement CERS rates that continue to go up is the, um, the major impact and, and factor in those increasing um, rates. And just want to point that out that, you know, the, the city employees are just such a wonderful dedicated group of people they continue to serve more and more residents um, even though the the amount of them stay stay fairly steady and we continue to um, ask the general staff um, all to do a little bit more um, with less and and just want to also as an extra reminder that that when we do add staff um, adding them to public safety continues to be one of our top priorities and I'd like to point out that, to your numbers that of the, th we talk about we've increased 39 staff members from 10 to 20, but of those 39, 24 of them are in public safety. So when you really talk about the number of employees that we just have out doing non-public safety work, that number is significantly smaller than 39. I don't know many people who are going to argue against enough officers to patrol the streets and enough firefighters to put out the fires uh, we we have continued we have been adding um a couple of police officers the last couple of years um but uh due to um, natural attrition, retirements, um, very long period to take someone that we have, a police officer that we've hired and actually they are able to, to work on their own, um, takes almost two years. So, um, and we, we continue to work on that to make sure that we do have enough police officers, but um, ho hopefully we should be leveling out in the next few years. How close does this get us in 2020 to full complement on the police force and how much overtime are we looking at for the police force not being at full complement? Sure, I don't have specific dollars on overtime. Um, while I can tell you that the majority of our overtime dollars are spent in the police department, um, public safety in general, but, but it, it's tending to lean a little bit on police right now because we do, um, we are experiencing some short staffing in certain areas. Um, it's been a while since we've been on full complement as far as actual bodies in the positions that they were hired for, um, and even more so because of the training gap. Um, right now, I believe that we're running around um, 
I, I, I want to say it's around negative three on, on patrol. So um, we're in the, we have two recruitment classes this year and um, they're, they're going well so far. So hopefully we'll be able to get there soon, but it's, it's, it's a constant process. That's three police officers for 2020 would fill those three vacancies. We'll have to after. fill the three we're short and mm -hmm. then this will add um, an additional three on patrol, on but we'll promote a sergeant. Okay. Um, that sergeant will need to be replaced and then the officer that we've committed to the high school will have to be replaced. So we all, we will be having to hire five for, for the positions that we've discussed. Well, you may not have it here. I wouldn't expect you to. Are we tracking how much overtime we're, do we track the difference in overtime of unavoidable overtime compared to overtime because we don't have enough personnel? I, I know that we do in the fire department, we're able to track because they're different overtime rates. Um, they, they have certain overtime rates for when, you know, their, their regular week, of course, is, is over 40 hours. Um, so we're able to track that versus when it's unscheduled. Um, I don't believe we specifically are able to track it in police for understaffing versus things that come up. So I just, the, the, the basis of my question is, do we know how much understaffing is really costing us. So if, and I'm gonna make up silly numbers, but if, if it takes $10 to have an officer and we're spending $30 in overtime, then for every officer that we don't have, it's costing us $20. Are we tracking that in any way? And, and I recognize we probably can't hire police officers anytime we want because there are training requirements that go along with that and, and when classes are in and who does that. But I wonder, are, are we, do we have a clear understanding of how much overtime is really costing it as it relates to understaffing? Um, you know, the police chief is behind me and I'm sure he, he's able to have a, probably a clearer answer than I do. But I would say is that um, the cost of understaffing, we're going to feel more in the time it takes for calls, um, for, for our officers to be able to respond, and in some of the, um, the services we are, that the police are able to provide. And when you have understaffing, that's more of where it's, where it's affected. Um, but, but specifically with the split out of, of overtime, um, I, I don't know that I have access to that. I think maybe Doug could speak to that. We went, we went for, was it six or seven years from 2010 till about 2017 where we didn't add any officers to our complement. And so uh, we had, you have retirements going on, you have people to leave and we kind of got behind the eight ball, I guess you'd say. And so uh, about this time last year, we realized that, you know, we, we're well short. So uh, Doug has worked on a staffing plan and that's where we got the five officers uh, that we're proposing for FY20. But uh, it's just gonna take some time. Like Aaron said, we, we've had a lot of officers we, we've hired, but it, it takes time to get them through the academy. It takes time to get them through field training before they can be out on the street by themselves in a car arresting people. So uh, we, we've got, we think we're, we're almost there, but it's, it's, we've got so far behind uh, where we didn't, we didn't have the money, didn't feel like we had the money to add to our complement to replace. And so we got behind and we think we're working our way back up to the, the right level now. And Doug has uh, put together, like I said, a, a staffing plan for the next couple of years. And we think we can get back to where we need to be and reduce overtime at the same time. But the, 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 the offset to that, Slim, is that uh, for every officer we hire, it, it's, it's expensive. It's, it's over a hundred grand by the time you buy them a car and you pay for the fringe and the CERS for hazardous is going to, it's going to be at 48% before we're, we're all said and done. And so we have to balance that out with what is the right number. And, and Doug is, is working on that. And he, you want to speak, speak to that? It, all overtime isn't due to a lack of a, a body. It's, right. Some of it is actually generating revenue, right? Right. And that's where I was just wondering, are, do we track differently 
over time that we think is related to understaffing as compared to other forms of overtime? Um, if I could, I, wanna, I, I don't want to um, conflate two issues because much of our overtime is not driven because of staff shortages. What is affected by staff shortages is people's ability to take days off because we will deny time off. Um, but we, we do have some backfill occasionally, right? If officers are in training, we will pay overtime to backfill those vacancies to cover for training. So there is some cost associated with short staffing, but what, what short staffing also does uh, to a significant degree is increase what we call occupied time. There's occupied time and there's unoccupied time from officers. So if you have fewer officers on shift, the same number of calls for service that occur on a regular basis, more of their time is consumed in answering, responding to, doing the reports associated with, making the arrest, doing all the paperwork associated with that. So more of their time is occupied. They're busier in, in effect. And so, which doesn't sound like a, a terrible problem, except for the fact we operate under a community policing concept at the Bowling Green Police Department, which requires unoccupied time from calls for service to be able to then go to these community meetings, to then engage in other ways in our community. And so there certainly is a modicum of overtime impact, but the real impact is our ability to do other things besides answer calls. Okay, and so staffing has, um, we still answer our calls for service today in as timely a manner as we can do. But there is, um, I can go back to 1994 when we had a study um, that led us into community policing. And they want, uh, experts in community policing don't want our time to be occupied more than about 60% on calls for service so that we can dedicate the other 40% to either proactive work or other community engagement. And so, Anything over that roughly 60% occupied time then starts to chip away at our effectiveness on the community policing side of this equation. And so it's not just overtime, it's our effectiveness in other areas as well. So we need to drive down occupied time by, ha by having more officers on shift available to spread those calls for service out. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that you answers bet. my question. You bet. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Aaron um, wanted me to go a, a little bit into how we came up with a recommendation on staffing. We took three different approaches. Um, there, are, there are some common, let's call them rules of thumbs, um, approaches. One is rules of two thumbs, if, if you have both thumbs. Um, one is uh, we use a method currently and have for years called the PAM study, which is a patrol allocation manual developed by Northwestern University. It's a mathematical problem based on certain um, data-driven issues. One of those is calls for service, the number of miles of roadways you have in your community, number of officers. It's a, it's, it's a math problem, right, as they all are. So we've been using this PAM study for years, um, continue to do that. We also measured the PAM study results, which is only a study designed to evaluate patrol staffing, not detective division staffing, not administrative position staffing, nothing else. So only patrol. We also looked at a, uh, the ICMA over a number of years has, has looked at a couple of different metrics to use to um, evaluate staffing. One is... You tell us what ICMA stands for. The Jeff will help me, the International <laughs> City Managers, Managers Association. Association. Yeah, which they're of some authority in this area. So years ago, before we adopted PAM, we used a, a couple of different approaches. One was an ICMA mathematical formula, which was not like PAM, but interestingly, when we applied it to our current circumstances, uh, the PAM study and the old ICMA mathematical formula uh, came to within one or two officer recommendation. They were almost equal in their recommendation. And then we, um, I looked up some literature and found some studies that across the United States, if you take an average of officers per capita 
for all agencies across the United States. It ranges from about 2.0 officers per thousand up to the high end of 2.6 officers per thousand. Well, you can do the math based on our local population. The 2.6 gives you a ridiculous number of officers um, for, for Bowling Green based on what we have. But the 2.0 on the lower end was almost identical to in line with both of the PAM study and the ICMA study as well. And so we looked at those three metrics and the validity based on the, the consistency of the number that it kept returning. And they were within one or two officer recommendation um, for, each, for each of those. And so we took the three numbers, we averaged those three numbers, and then we um, used that as a numerical representation of the number of officers we needed. And then we, um, at, at the city manager's permission, I was um, allowed to develop a, um, what I think is a, a six-year plan to add these number of officers. Obviously, you can't add these number of officers in a single year. So we had a, a five-year plan, and then the sixth year actually adds um, an, or requests, whether it adds or not is a different matter, requests uh, five additional officers um, because, as Aaron spoke to it a minute ago, it takes so long to hire and to train and to get them fully functional that you need to have a cushion of officers that are always in that hiring and training phase and then have your full amount of officers ideally fully functional. So anyway, that's how we got to where we are. I think the, I think the recommendation is valid. I think um, it is not extreme. And, um, but, I, but I don't think, to answer the question of overtime, most of our overtime is driven by special details, which we recover some of that money through um, contracts, service contracts, and then late calls. We'll get calls that will either be late in the shift requiring somebody to just work overtime to fulfill the requirements of that call or they're real serious calls that take a lot of manpower and a lot of time. So I don't, I don't want to create the expectation that you add more officers that we're going to drive down overtime costs a lot because that's typically not what's driving most of our overtime costs. Thank Karen, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to phone a friend. My fourth grade math teacher is pleased that I can solve a word problem. Um, moving on to the fun. So retirement system costs. Um, uh, mandated 12% rate increase that takes hazardous duty from 35.34% to 39.59 and non-has to 21.48 to 24%. Uh, the budget impact is um, uh, a little over 1.3 million with all budget recommendations included. Uh, just a reminder on Senate Bill 151 that was passed, um, that litigation um, did void legislation and so it did not take effect. Um, when we were preparing this in the budget year last year, there was a million dollars set aside for that and that ended up being a fund transfer to the health care fund this year that was much needed. Um, here is a projection of where our CERS rate, um, our, well, the history and where it's going. So you can see um, that it was generally stable um, until the um, House Bill 362, which increased um, the rates over time. And, and if no additional bills are passed regarding um, the, the CERS rates, this is where we will be projected in FY 2024. We have a slide that says what it is in terms of the millions each year that's going to be added. Um, that would be, you know, it'd be projected based on colas and steps, and, and each year we do that. I'm sure that Katie has one. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't have one here tonight. Take, uh, just take your 1.3 and grow it by 12% each year. Exactly. Um, jumping over to employee benefits, um, just a, a little bit of history on some things we've done with benefits. In January of 2018, we converted all of our employees over to a HRA plan with a higher deductible um, and out-of-pocket maximums. 
Um, the 2018 costs were slightly down um, from FY 2017. Um, that's not a normal trend. And so a couple of things to just explain that. We had a couple of high claimants, both in medical and prescription, that were not repeated year over year. Um, we also had a reduction that we took in June um, for our claims incurred but not paid. It um, turned out to be much less than what we had been budgeting throughout the year. Um, so that took a big chunk of that as well. Um, in addition to that, we also took on a higher specific deductible with our stop loss for an exchange for a premium decrease. Um, it paid off that year. We ended up between um, the decrease in our premiums and what we ended up having to pay out in the claims at the higher deductible rate, um, we ended up being about flat, which is pretty um, unusual for stop loss rates, and, and that was something we experienced that this year. Um, it's not something, um, uh, we have a, a slightly different setup that we're going to be having for this next year with our stop loss, which also includes a decrease in our premiums um, as we switch um, vendors, and, and that will be presented probably um, uh, probably at the second meeting in June. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about our, our, our stop loss for FY20. Um, also wanted to note that um, in this past year, our medical claims um, have been trending down, and that is, as I spoke to earlier in the meeting, um, we think a reflection of having the city care center open, and um, that the amount is, is right around that $400,000 amount, but we are not getting any relief whatsoever from prescriptions. It continues to eat up any decrease we're getting in medical claims plus some. FY19, April claims were up about 3%. Um, the total plan cost was up 2.5%. Um, in FY20, I have recommended a balanced budget for the health care fund. Um, that's not something we have been doing in the past. We haven't had to. We've had, um, actually, in several years back, um, it was a very healthy fund, and we didn't even have to fully fund it. And, and so we got in the practice of doing that. Um, but over time, due to increase, of course, in medical claims and prescription claims, stop loss claims and whatnot, um, we, we, any of the surplus that we had in that has been, has been eaten up, and we've been covering it for the past four or five years with general fund transfers. Um, so what we are presenting this year is to increase both the employer and the employee premiums to achieve closer to a 95, 5% split. Um, that's not going to make up a lot of the difference that we need there. The majority of is going to be taken on by the city, um, in increasing those premiums slightly. And then we are also going to um, make an adjustment where um, we have about $1.6 in fixed costs. That does include our stop loss premiums. It also includes our administrative fees to our consultant, to our TPA, um, to other in incentives, wellness incentives that we do that pays for the city care center, our supplies, our doctor, our nurse, our administrative fees to care here that we spoke about earlier. Um, and up to this point, we haven't really been budgeting for that. So in, in FY20, we will be switching to putting that in position budgeting, and um, we'll be accounting for that 1.6 million on the city side only, but that way, we should not have to do one of those giant fund transfers sometime later in the year. What are lasers in this context? So a, a laser has to do with our stop loss coverage, and um, when a, um, a vendor will will look at specific claims, claimants that are on our plan that are particularly high, um, ones that probably have been had to be paid out in the past, and if they are, the odds of them are continuing, they basically, a laser is almost carving them out of the specific deductible. And so they set certain limits that it's almost like a specific deductible for that individual. Normally it's an aggregate, um, but, but they will kind of be carved out. They will have, the city will have the burden of meeting um, the maximum that they set for those claimants um, before anything will go towards the aggregate deductible for the city. So 
Um, that, that's, that's, it, it's a risk you take in order to get some lower premiums, and, and hopefully it will pan out for this year. We've, um, we've received, received advice from our consultant that they think that um, it's those, those lasers are a low risk to the city, and um, this will hopefully pan out in our favor. This, this year we didn't have any lasers. This will be a new... We, we were with the same vendor year over year, and they presented us with a... Um, a renewal that did not include lasers, but um, the renewal premiums were very high, and they presented in that um, that renewals for next year would be even even greater. So this is a good time to switch, especially when we got a good offer from another vendor. All right, and believe this is um, the last slide on this this just shows general the blue is the overall plan spend the yellow is showing us our um, claims um, through FY 18 um, that's all that's completed it's it's a little bit tough right now especially with the TPA switch that we had starting at the beginning of this calendar year um, getting those claims up and running um, we'll, we'll be able to know what what those are year over year um, probably um, sometime later in, in the fall. So here is an overview of the personnel expenditures by all funds and by general funds. Um, just to note the police department that does include um, dispatch as well. Um, so you can see the, the breakdown from, um, from department on where our personnel expenditures lie. Uh, just a brief summary of everything we talked about. We're recommending the full-time COLA at 1.9 plus an average 1.35 merit for all eligible employees. Part-time 20 cents on the pay scale, an additional 15 um, cent step. CERS rates are up. I think you've heard that a few times now. Uh, eight reclassification requests, nine new positions, and uh, a reorganization of some part-time workers over at Parks. Hey, I think Slim had a question, then we're going to take a break. One question, and I promise, just one. I want to make one. Just one. I Everyone make heard that, sure right? That I, yeah. That he, he, he'd been waiting to bang that gavel on me for years. Uh, I want to make sure that I understand that our lowest pay rate in the city is nine seventy an hour, and that if you work in the same position for more than a year, even if it's seasonal, you're eligible for a 35 cent per hour increase on year two. Um, well, the, nine, the 970 is the new rate and it includes that 20 cents. So that's built in, so it'd be an additional 15%, 15 cents on top of that. So 970 is the new lowest rate that includes the 20 cents don't, and we don't we don't have any seasonals that are here for a year do we they're only here for nine months uh, we, we could have a rehire and, and they would they would be um, eligible for the step Within after they 12 months that's what I was okay asking. after they return and and they have to complete um, some time period back with us but it is 12 months I'm sorry it's still the same question because <laughs> Uh, it, what I mean is, if is a lifeguard who might be employed with the city for, I don't know, four months, are they eligible for the step the second year they're rehired, or do they have to go to the third year they're rehired when they, account, when they accumulate 12 months? It should be the second year they're rehired. Got it. Right. Yeah. So, so they would not only come back with the wage scale being increased, <sighs> but they would also be eligible for an additional 15 cents, so they would be a little bit above their peers who perhaps are new since they're in a second or third season. Great, thank you. Ms. Aaron, we appreciate it, and we're gonna take just a couple minutes break, and we'll be right back.
We're ready when you are. Okay, ring the bell. All right, let's return back, and Aaron Ballou is here with us now. Thank you. Afternoon. I will present the capital budget, the capital improvement um, program. I'll try to be brief um, as best I can. Um, as I go through the slides um, after this one, um, we have all the capital projects listed, um, but I'm only going to hit the highlights. Um, but if there's something you have a question on, please just let me know as I'm going through those slides. Uh, as a part of the, can you name the projects as you going through this chart? As I'm going through the chart? Yeah, can you name the projects that are under the capital improvement program? That's what we're going to talk about after this. Okay. okay. <laughs> the individual projects what I'm talking about. Oh, yes, we'll go over, I won't go over every single one, they're listed. Um, but if you have a question about a particular one, we can talk about that too. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for the city's capital improvement plan, that is an annual plan of project expenditures for public facilities and infrastructure. It shows the estimated cost and the sources of funding for all the city projects that cost over $25,000 and have an estimated life of at least five years. Um, so these are the bigger projects um, that um, are part of this capital improvement plan. You'll see for FY20, the total CIP is $25.8 million. Um, that is a slight decrease from the prior year, and Katie mentioned earlier that was due to several one-time projects that were funded with the FY19 budget. Debt only in FY20 is um, decreasing to $11.1 .1 million. It's a decrease of almost $700,000 in one year. I don't understand what debt only means in this context. What do you mean? Um, the total CIP for um, FY20 is $25.8 million. Debt related to that capital is $11 million. So actual projects, um, things we're actually going to do next year and fund um, is $14.7 million of stuff. The rest of it is the debt. This is, this is debt service payments that we'll have to pay in FY20. Um, you'll also notice the general fund contribution to the capital plan in FY20 is $4.8 million. That's quite a decrease from last year, but again, $3 million of that is the Lover's Lane Fire Station, um, there were several road projects funded in FY19 at a higher level than they're being proposed to be funded in FY20. Um, that makes up for that difference. I also want to point out on this slide, um, 2010, fiscal year 2010. That year there was a total CIP of $15 million and $12 million of that was debt. So there was really only $3 million worth of capital projects that year. This year we have almost $15 million worth of capital projects. So that's a total capital project increase of 67.5% um, FY20 compared to FY10. Okay, this next slide shows how we categorize the capital improvement plan. We kind of um, split it out between four major strategic plan goals. That is for uh, municipal facilities and equipment, traffic and roads, technology improvements, and community livability. You can see the two largest pieces of that pie are for the municipal facilities and equipment and the traffic and roads. Both of those are about 33% for FY20. Okay, and I mentioned um, after this, we're gonna go over some of the actual capital projects. Um, I'm only gonna hit the highlights, so um, they're all listed. If there's one you'd like um, an explanation on or more info, just let me know. And this year in the budget, we did really expand the capital um, improvement plan section. That's Appendix E. Any capital um, improvement um, project that spans more than one year has its own page this year. And we provided more information about the project, its funding sources, and prior year activity. So there's lots and lots of information on all of these in your Appendix E. Okay, starting with community livability in FY20, that has a $2.3 million budget um, of the CIP plan. Community livability is, are um, projects that seek to enhance the quality of life in the local community through strong neighborhoods, through walkable spaces, and through more public recreational offerings. In FY20, we're continuing with our sidewalk improvement program. That's something we've done since FY08. Um, we've done over 15 miles of new sidewalks since that time, um, and we've used um, almost $7 million of general fund money to do that since 2008. So we're going to appropriate a half million dollars again in FY20 to continue that program. We also continue with the $100,000 to um, resurface um, and reconfigure existing sidewalks. 
We've done about four miles of sidewalks since 2011 with that program. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, we're continuing the stormwater mitigation program at another half million dollars in FY20. We've done that since 2010. Okay, Parks and Recreation has a total budget in the community, li community livability category of $425,000. The main project um, under Parks um, here is for the replacement of the bunkers at the Crosswinds Golf Course. That is a two-year project, so FY20 will be the first year at $250,000. The total project is to replace all 41 bunkers. Next year, we're going to replace 25 of those 41. How long do those replacements last? How often do we have to do that? The ones that are currently in place, um, were they original to the course? So those are from 1993. Okay. Um, next with community livability is the Bowling Green, the BG reinvestment area for the neighborhood improvement program. This was started with FY15 and we are currently in our second target area um, of this program. So there's one target area um, that's listed from FY15 to FY17. We're in a different target area right now, um, in FY19 that is ending, and FY20 is going to begin the budget with a new target area. That's gonna be a two-year project with a total of $1.4 million, but in FY20 there's just over $729,000. $200,000 of that is gonna come from the general fund, and just over $529,000 will come from federal grant money. Okay, the next category for the CIP plan is improved traffic flow. The total um, budget for this category for next year will be $4.85 million. Um, you can see the biggest piece of that, $2 million, is dedicated to the street resurfacing program or the street overlay program. Um, that's been in existence um, since about 2016, and we've really been tracking that. Um, we're going to have a million dollars in city general fund money toward that, and we're going to have a million dollars of state tax revenue. Um, to complement that, so a total of $2 million budget. With our current capacity, that's about 16 miles of roadway we'll be able to resurface next year. Since 2016, we are right at 150 miles of roadway that's been resurfaced, and we've been able to um, really increase our um, allocation um, for the roads. Um, we have spent or increased our budget by over 137% since 2006 for this. I will mention Small House Road um, also has a budget in FY20 of a half million dollars. We're moving on to phase three in FY20. You can see phase one and two have been previously budget, budgeted. Um, FY20 is phase three, as I mentioned, and that will be over a total of three years. So this first year is a half million dollars um, to work on the design and property acquisition for that project. Okay, also with improved traffic flow, we have the Shav Lane project. This project also started in a previous year, actually in this current year, FY19. The FY20 funding is for to complete phase one and start on phase two, and it's going to be one, just over $1.2 million for FY20. Construction for phase two is expected to begin in FY20 and 22. Can I ask a question, and I know Greg's not here, so I don't know if sure. we have an answer, but uh, with the pedestrian safety of the folks who live around Shive Lane and crossing the street, I know there's been some issues around some pedestrian accidents. And so I'm just curious if we know, and I don't know, Ben, if you would know this, if the state plans to come alongside of our work on Shive Lane with some pedestrian safety improvements at all? Sorry, I'm not aware. Um, the easy answer is yes, that's all being looked at, but I don't know, I do not know the details of that. Um, along with the, um, the city shoveling improvements, I know the state has coordinate the, all of the improvements at Cave Mill Road intersection as well as some safety improvements along that section of uh, Scottsville Road as well. Uh, but pedestrian improvements are part of, part of those discussions and, and plans. Uh, the details, I'm, I'm not sure on. But was that approved for this next fiscal year or is that just talked about as a possibility? I can't answer that. Okay. Okay, moving on to downtown improvements, which is also a part of improved traffic flow. 
The downtown improvements project um, is currently, um, as you can see, in progress right now downtown. That's in phase one right now. Um, for FY20, we are budgeting phase two, year one. Um, we expect this will be a two-year project um, for phase two with a total of one and a half million dollars, but we're appropriating a half million dollars for FY20 to continue with the improvements um, downtown. Okay, moving on to our next category, technology improvements. For FY20, we have $2.8 million dedicated to this. You can see there are several projects within the information technology department, um, mainly the replacement of the police mobile um, um, data computers in the docking stations in, stations in each of the patrol cars. Um, but really the big project under technology is for the computer um, aided dispatch or CAD. Um, this is gonna be a one, over a $1.9 million project. Um, and this project will replace the software that's used by the police department's communication division to build their calls and dispatch units from the city's 911 center. The project includes both software and hardware purchases, and the funding is comprised of $400,000 from the general fund, and over uh, the rest of it, the million and a, or one and a half million dollars, sorry, from the E911 and the wireless 911 special revenue funds. So this project is not financed. We are using cash from the general fund and cash that we have saved in those special revenue funds to fully fund this project next year. And does this new CAD system uh, make it to where you can do text messages to 911 or other for ways to contact 911? That's the phone system, the next gen phone system that's already been purchased and we're waiting, I believe, for the state to actually implement some of that text messaging part of it, but we that's already in the works and planned. Okay, so that's not a part of this upgrade? No, okay. this is completely the, the CAD system which gets all of the 911 calls and base is able to dispatch those out. We're also applying for grant funds. Yes. So if we do receive those grant funds, then the general fund obligation would of course be reduced and we would see how we would get the right mix of funding. Okay, moving on to facilities and equipment. This is $4.8 million in the FY20 budget. Um, you can see the biggest piece of this $4.8 million is just over $3 million for equipment and vehicle replacement. Um, this is new um, vehicles, completely new vehicles and replacing old vehicles. Um, again, there's lots of um, different items here, um, so I'll just hit the highlights. And on this first slide, you can see the highlight is the fire department. Um, we've already mentioned that the fire department um, was going to purchase two new apparatus um, in FY20, and that's at a cost of just over $1.5 million. It's a new aerial um, truck that's going to replace an existing um, aerial truck that's currently out there. Um, the, that truck will be moved into reserve status. And then it's a brand new fire engine that will be placed at the Lover's Lane station next year. So to fund those two um, trucks, um, Katie um, had mentioned that um, we will be using financing from the fire improvement fund um, to fund those. Um, so that will not use any general fund dollars to make those purchases. Okay, um, vehicles and equipment continued. Um, Public Works has $530,000 that is mainly for the purchase of an additional vacuum truck. There's currently one truck, um, but this will be a new truck to help us um, address stormwater issues after a rain event and to help keep the city's um, storm um, drainage system free of debris and help us address these issues faster. Um, also, Parks and Rec um, is, re uh, is receiving several um, vehicles. Parks and Rec also receives several hand-me-down vehicles every year, so um, they're receiving a few smaller pieces of equipment next year, but they're also receiving some um, hand-me-down cars from the IT department and also from the fire department. Okay, moving on to facility improvements and other equipment. This is just over $1.7 million. Um, the biggest um, item here you'll see is the Sloan Convention Center interior upgrades. Um, this is for carpet replacement, which we're on a schedule to do, um, I believe, every um, four or five years. Um, wall treatments, lighting, and ceiling and tiling. Um, so um, this is um, interior upgrades. And it's important to note that the Convention Center has its own revenue stream. So this is not um, general fund tax dollars. This is funding coming straight from um, um, their, their revenue stream at the Convention Center. Okay, here's just a brief uh, or a nice slide to show the history of CIP. 
I'd like to start with FY10 again, where we have um, a $15 million budget, but you can see pretty much all of that is yellow, so all of that is mainly debt. And we have that little piece of blue that were our actual capital projects that year of $3 million. Then when you fast forward to FY20, you see we're just, um, just shy of $26 million, but we have a lot of blue now. Um, we have almost $15 million of actual projects we're able to do um, now than we were in the past. And you can see the red um, area, that is where the general fund has been able to contribute over the years at different levels. Okay, the capital program in review, $25.8 million total next year. That's about 13% less than in FY19. Um, again, we're not using any general fund fund balance for the sixth consecutive year. And there's also no new general fund debt. Um, I did mention we are recommending debt for the purchase of those two fire trucks, but that's coming from the fire improvement fund. Um, this budget um, does provide almost $5 million for road and traffic improvements. And we are also um, purchasing several pieces of equipment and doing facility improvements just mentioned. Okay, so I'll move on to debt from capital. Um, this is just a, sh a short summary of our capital program, or I'm sorry, debt um, for FY20 compared to FY19. So you can see our FY20 um, recommended debt budget, and this is just for the general fund. Um, it's just over $5 million. In FY19, it wasn't much more than that, and we're expected in the year just at $5,085,000. See, there's three smaller leases and notes that are expiring in FY19 um, that just came to the regular end of their term. Um, you can also see we're at 6.9% of general fund expenditures both years. That's due to the actual um, recalibration of the general fund um, budget from $74 million to $72 million. Um, so if that had stayed the same or risen as it usually does, then our percentage of debt would have decreased. Last year, instead of 6.9, that was 7.8, and the year before is 8.7. So we usually see that decrease every year. Um, I did also want to point out that with the exception of the ballpark bonds, all of the city debt will be fully retired by 2033. So that's about 13, 14 years we're going to have no debt except for the ballpark bonds. Uh, it matures in 2033? Everything except the ballpark. The ballpark it's, or matures in 2038. So a few more years. Come make it, Joe. You'll still be here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this next slide shows um, debt service funding. We talked about general fund debt service. That's not the only um, um, funding source that pays for debt service. Um, it's about 45.3% or about that $5 million next year. Um, reimbursements, that um, greenish um, slice of the pie is 36.3%. That's debt that's reimbursed to us from WKU and from Warren County um, to pay for debt issues um, that um, they have a hand in with us. And that is about $4 million next year. The yellowish piece uh, is for special revenue funds. That's primarily the fire improvement fund to pay for um, debt associated to their fire trucks. Um, you will notice. From Warren County? I'm sorry? What did you say about Warren County? Um, they help us um, contribute toward the debt for the trans park. Um, they pay half the debt on that. Um, so that's the big piece um, they pay for. And then WKU pays for all of that debt, and that's about $2.5 million um, just for WKU next year. Um, I do want to point out that the Enterprise Fund um, slice is gone now from this. Um, um, someone alluded earlier, mentioned earlier that uh, the Convention Center debt um, was retired this year. Um, it matured fully, um, so there's no more debt um, to be paid um, for the Convention Center by the Convention Center. Um, and that's a savings of over $700,000 um, this year. Okay, we'd like to show this slide every year to show where we've come from since FY 2000, 2009. Um, this is our high watermark for debt. It was $148 million. And then we estimate at the end of FY19 our total outstanding debt for everything um, that is on, has the city's name for debt will be $73.2 million. So in that 11 years, we have um, nearly halved our debt. That's a reduction of $75 million, or just over 50% of our debt load um, in 11 years. Um, we've mainly done that by just making our regular scheduled payments and not adding in any new debt. Um, we have, along the way, tried to retire debt early, um, but really the biggest thing is that we just have paid for everything in cash the last several years. Okay, this next slide is switching gears to fund balance. 
Um, this is more of an accounting thing. We like to talk about this at year end. Um, so um, this fund balance, it is defined as the remaining equity after we've paid all our bills. So after we have done everything we've budgeted, this is what we're gonna have left. So we estimate um, at the end um, of FY19, the beginning of FY20, there's gonna be 25.7 um, million dollars. 18 million of that is allocated toward our committed fund balance. That committed fund balance is like a rainy day fund. We established that years and years ago, and we recently increased it um, from 20 to 25% of our um, adopted revenue budget. So in FY20, since our adopted revenue budget is less than in the prior year, our committed fund balance is actually decreasing by about $450,000. So the amount that we have to keep in our rainy day fund is actually a little bit less than it was in the prior year. But that actually moves that to that unassigned fund balance that's available for any things that come up throughout the year. Um, that $3 million, that's just the money that is um, for projects that are still um, outstanding or still in progress at the end of June. So they just carry forward from one year to the next. Um, and that leaves us with that $4.6 million that we have available next year for anything that may arise. So we can get a new air conditioner. Oh. <laughs> okay, this slide just is a comparison of our total, our general fund expenditures by type. Um, this is a sort of a repeat of that revenue side we saw earlier where we're down the two and a half percent. And it just shows you um, where those changes have happened this year. Again, um, as Katie mentioned earlier, the biggest reduction is in the miscellaneous and transfers out where we have brought our capital improvement program um, to balance our general fund spending. So we're able to afford the increases in our personnel costs. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, this is a comparison of um, total expenditures. It's two pie charts that we compare the general fund and all funds. Um, the most important thing to see on this pie chart is the biggest slide under the general fund is personnel services. That is 62.2%. Last year that was 55.6%. So that's more than a six point jump in one year. So that's, that's big. Um, but we've been able to manage that by that transfers out slice that's right beside of it. That slice in the general fund in FY20 is 15%. Last year that was 23.3%. So we're managing our growth in personnel by looking at the other expenses that we're proposing for next year. Okay, and that's all I have. I will turn it over to Katie to discuss agency funding and to close the presentation. Karen, we appreciate it. We're getting really close to the end. And I appreciate all of the agency representatives for hanging out and waiting for this part of the budget. Uh, you may recall uh, back in November, December, we revised the list of eligible agencies for funding. We removed public transit from that list, basically because that is a uh, competitive bid service, and none of these others are bid out the way that particular process is. So uh, we do have funds in the budget for public transit, but it's just not part of this process anymore. So we have decreased, obviously, uh, the agency funding by 26.8%, and that is because of the, the transit money being removed. When can, will that be bid out? Uh, it's a three-year bid. It will be a discussion on June 18th for the... Okay. The Upcoming transit. discussion? Yeah. One more year on this contract, and then it will have to go out to re-bid for a new contract. Thank you. We have uh, significantly reduced our agency funding through the years. The uh, spike we had in FY18 and 19 was specifically due to transit funding. So again, we have removed that from this particular process. Question. Uh, the Human Rights Commission requested 75,000 and we are recommending 67.9, why is that? Uh, there were three agencies that requested an increase. Uh, one of the agencies, the increase was $25,000 for drug task force. That was for a specific purses, per, sorry, purpose uh, to fund 50% of a new deputy director salary. We would share that expense with the county so they would cover the other 50%. Uh, the other two agencies that requested increases, the Hobson House Commission and the Human Rights Commission. We have traditionally recommended up to a 3% increase. 
The amount that the Human Rights Commission requested was 13.6% over their FY19 appropriated amount. So the recommendation coming forth is for only up to a 3% increase. However, the Board of Commissioners has the opportunity to make those changes if you choose to provide more funding. Well, I was just looking at all the others and uh, their request uh, they got. And, uh, uh, with the Hobson House Commission, they actually didn't get the full amount that they requested. Again, up to 3%. They requested over 3.5%. Um, but we wanted to be consistent with each of those agencies and provide up to the 3%. And that has been consistent with how we have presented those uh, proposals in the past when an agency has requested an increase. It amounts to about uh, $1,980 for the Human Rights Commission and another $1,725 for the Hobson House Commission. I have no problem in giving the Human Rights Commission uh, what they have requested because I know there have been years to where they hadn't gotten anything or requested only what uh, the budget was. They did receive exactly what they requested last year, which was an increase over FY18, but you are correct. They have not received significant increases through the years. Am I correct in my understanding that the additional money is for employee costs? That is what was presented um, in your, uh, you all got a copy of the applications that were submitted for the agency funding and the Human Rights Re um, Commission's request was to increase funding to add to salary and employee benefits. And then same, similar for the Hobson House Commission, they requested uh, additional funding for operational expenses and to have funds to, excuse me, ensure that Riverview is properly staffed. And is it accurate that there, the staff at the Human Rights Commission has not had an increase in salary of any type in six years? Seven. Seven years? Seven. I would support Commissioner Denning's proposal to award them the 75000 that they requested. Okay, I see. I see a majority of you agree to that. Okay. Uh, what we will do is we aren't going to change the budget bottom line, but I will come up with the additional funding out of the contingency account. So we'll just kind of rebalance contingency with the increase you want to add to this particular agency. You will have the opportunity to approve those specific appropriations at the June 18th board meeting. So there has to be separate action by municipal order for each of those approvals, but we will include the 75,000 on that particular one for Human Rights Commission. Okay. Uh, one other item of note on that particular page, uh, the. Golden Green Warren County Welfare Center, their annual appropriation is $50,000. However, based on some direction in 2008 that the board provided, any excess gas, gas franchise fees that the city receives above $200,000 is paid out to the Welfare Center. So in FY18, they received an additional $8,319. So that's why there's an actual amount greater than $50,000 on that um, chart. And then we are looking at an additional $11,600 for this fiscal year that will be paid out this month. So the, again, they'll get over $60,000 in FY19. We won't know until next May if there'll be additional gas franchise money available uh, to pay out to them in the future. But again, anything over $200,000 is what, what has been dedicated toward that. Good. All right, there's some other related agency funding items. I've already spoke of one of these uh, related to the airport. $199,750 is being uh, added to the budget, again, for the reconstruction of the taxiway alpha. Um, again, the city is required to match any grant funding that they receive. The past several years, we actually have not budgeted any money in that account. We've simply carried forward the available funds from previous years. We have spent all of that money up to this point and a little bit extra on some other grants that you all have approved and have come through. And so we will be needing to add the full 199750 to our budget for next year. In addition, 
Uh, we have $10,000 for emergency management in order to expand or upgrade the existing outdoor warning system within the city limits. And they don't spend $10,000 every year. They'll allow that money to sort of accumulate. This past year, I think they spent about $24,000 from saving three years' worth of $10,000 in funding. And they, they did some upgrades. And then for the past several years, the city has traditionally provided a dollar-for-dollar -dollar match of employee pledges to United Way. This amount reflects a match of those pledges for which an employee did not receive any other benefits. So it is $3,000, $3,100, that is less than in previous years. However, our employees can, have pledged a significant amount more than in previous years this year, but they've gained um, some additional city benefit from that pledge. So we're just providing the $3,000 at this point. Plus they get the $50,000 for the 211. So with all of those, uh, additions. The um, agency funding, again, without transit, uh, would have shown an increase in the baseline of about 2.7 percent over FY19, if you're looking again at apples to apples, removing the transit from that equation. Um, and it's 1.8 percent of the general fund expenditures with all of the additional agency funding proposed. Any other questions? I just want to reiterate because I hear from people regularly about transit. We are not eliminating transit in the city of Bowling Green or out of the budget. It's just out of this portion of the budget. That is correct. Yeah, yeah we have not reduced the amount of funding. We don't know exactly what the future funding will need to be. Uh, so we just implemented the same amount of funding for next year as it is this year. But again, that will be addressed later in the year. Okay. And then one final thought that I have, and that is that, you know, we, we laugh about how long this takes, uh, but uh, working on a budget in my non-city commission life that is a fraction of this big, I recognize how painstaking this process is. And so I don't want ever our, our jovial nature about giving people a, a difficult time about how long it's taking to to look like we don't respect the amount of time that it takes or appreciate the amount of detail that's put into it. It's a six-month process. It kicks off in January with your strategic planning session, um, but it does take us several months to get through this particular process and get this presentation ready for you. Um, so with all of that said, we're done with the presentation, certainly available for questions. I would like to extend an appreciation to our graphics designer, Laura Harris, for this year's budget graphics and presentation design. And I would like to recognize Erin Ballou for all of the work with the development and expansion of this year's budget summary. She literally comes up with the ideas and how we can make this uh, document better, more relevant, um, and available and understandable for public consumption. So we appreciate all of her efforts. Yeah. Who wants, and, and I, I'll, I'll bet any of you that will get an award on this thing here too. So, yes. uh, you want, you and when you, you get the, when you can get the stockbrokers excited about something, that's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I was wondering if somebody from the airport is here. I believe Susan. Susan? Um, I just had a question around, because um, I think this was all done before I um, came on board the commission, but about the construction of the fence. And um, I guess if any of these funds, in terms of this grant you're looking at getting, are related to any perimeter uh, upgrades or anything like that? Perimeter fence is just complete. It will be. It should be complete by May 31st. Uh, that was on a grant that was approved mm -hmm. for this current fiscal year. From the federal government? We had FAA 90%, state is 10 or 5%, and the city county is 2.5%. Okay. Any other questions? How we do have questions? department heads here and other agency representatives if you have any other questions. They have patiently waited through all of this presentation in the wonderfully warm room that we have tonight. I, I do have a comment. I want to personally thank every agency that is represented here. And if you're not represented, I still want to thank you for the work that you do to make Bowling Green the great community that it is and continues to be. Thank you all.
If there are no other questions, just briefly, the process up next is we will prepare a budget ordinance. Again, the bottom line won't change. We'll adjust for agency appropriations at the next meeting, but our budget ordinance will be presented at the June 4th meeting for your consideration, along with some other related um, personnel reclassification ordinances and some other items. That's it, then I'm done with presentation, so it's up to you now. One final comment. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was a long evening, but it was good information. We appreciate you helping us understand what's going on with city finances. Uh, but we do have an opportunity. Y'all are welcome to stick around if you want. We have a public comment section if there's anybody. Anybody signed up, Doug? No public comments. In that case, our next scheduled meeting is Tuesday, June 4th, 4.30. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>